Cheers. Looks like. Both All right, it is 5, five o'clock. We're going to go ahead and begin our special session. We have two items on the agenda tonight, and we will begin with a continued discussion regarding the lease and or sale of property located at 101, 112, 113, 115, 116, and 118 West Gray Street. Ms. Walker. Good evening. Okay, so we came, uh, I think I talked about this on November 2nd, and kind of got some ideas from council the feedback i was understanding from that meeting were preference for either a long-term lease or a sale of the property uh, with some reversionary right and right or right of first refusal um as i said last time uh, we had a lot of details to be worked out with factory obscura folks who are here tonight and so in a minute i'll turn it over to them but they have been working closely with uh, their founders group uh, to look at the different options that are, are good for them. And uh, as I said last time, for us, it'll be um, all about the numbers, right? So what, what does that price point look like? What's, what's the benefit? What's, what kind of jobs are being created? Those kind of things. And so with that, I want to turn it over to our friends at Factory Obscura if you all want to introduce yourselves and then yeah. you want to come on up? Um, my name is Laurel Massena, co-founder of Factory Obscura. Hi, I'm Laura Phillips, one of the co-founders of Factory Obscura. I'm Kelsey Carper. I'm also one of the co-founders. <laughs> so you might want to, you might provide an update on where you all are at and in your work. Yes, so we um, are continuing to meet with potential investors. Um, our company is a, a for-profit company that will uh, engage uh, artists collaboratively to to build an immersive art uh, installation. Uh, we are uh, projecting to bring in, in a half million tourists or uh, visitors per year. And our performance shows that in the uh, year three to five uh, of operation, we'll be employing 70 employees. Uh, and probably more. <laughs> That's our low estimate. But uh, to that includes artists and uh, other professionals at a uh, what we call a fighting wage level, uh, more likely <coughs> well over fifty thousand dollars a year on average. Um, this is the short version of it. I don't know how much detail we want to get into today. But. So as, as we, we spoke earlier today, we were emailing and I told them council's feedback from the last meeting and, and uh, that's the direction we're going to head in. I think they're, they're on the same page as we are as far as lease, long-term lease or purchase, uh, continuing to work with their investors to determine what that path looks like. But uh, we'll be looking at performance standards based on some of these projections as well. Uh, question for Laurent. Uh, the State Department of Commerce uh, identifies jobs as quality jobs at $17 an hour plus benefits. If, if that is kind of the range or better we're looking at, then uh, that's a, an aspect of Factory Obscura we will pursue through the state uh, to potentially provide some uh, payroll incentives to Factory Obscura to create those types of quality jobs here in Norman. So I'll make a note that these w these will qualify as quality jobs according to that definition. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. At our current location uh, on 9th Street, uh, our, the, the, the lowest uh, pay raise that we uh, have is 17 yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, so where are you uh, So what's the timeline on this decision? So the, the timeline is going to depend on when we can raise the funds. Uh, from the time we raise funds, we anticipate uh, two and a half years for the completion of the first phase, and then another year for the completion of the second phase. We will, during construction and design, we intend to insert already some elements that will for a little bit of interest and some, uh, some energy in the building. Uh, it follows a model that we adopted at our current location instead, where we were able to open 
small portions uh, of the uh, buildings uh, and make it attractive, create some community-based event and really start engaging the, the, the whole city and, and uh, the surrounding for participation. To share with Council some information on the status of uh, the building on Gray, uh, currently housing our building maintenance operation. Uh, it's got some building maintenance parts, inventory, and then some long-term storage. Um, we have an option uh, to move that operation into um, similar space, just new construction that's currently underway, uh, much closer to North Base where our other uh, operations of you know similar use uh, currently take place. That space could be available to us as early as March. Um, just wanted to put that timetable out there to make sure that would fit into the timetable you think you guys are uh, preparing for. Yeah. Excellent. Do you have a preference for long-term lease or purchase? Currently, we lean for the purchase option, but um, I, I think it will largely depend on the majority, the, the, the main investor. Uh, we anticipate that a group of investors uh, will have a lot of say on <laughs> what direction they, they, that makes sense financially for them. So. Um, mm -hmm. Answer, we'll, we'll hope to know the final answer in a few months. Even if both options are on the table, I think we, we should take, maybe need to present and continue to uh, work through the... Excellent. Do we have a timeline on those negotiations? Those are hard to... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I could tell you but with certainty that, that uh, um, we have a... Uh, meeting slated with uh, a large group of very interested investors in less than a month. And so that will be a, a determining turning point. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, from there, we'll be able to give you a better uh, timeline. OK. Because I don't think we're trying to sell this to anyone else, but Correct. I don't want to mm -hmm. drag it on forever, so we'd all like to know what's going no, on. No, we don't either. Okay. <laughs> okay. Council for Hall. Yeah. Um, I, I just had um, a few questions. I've gotten, you know, some feedback from constituents in Ward 4, and of course this would be in Heart and Soul of Norman in Ward 4. And um, we began this conversation, I think I first met you all last March. And so it's been a running conversation, and we do have a lot of new council members on board now. So there are a couple of things that I just wanted to pursue on um, the whole aspect of, um, that I think was really intriguing to us at the beginning of paying a thriving wage. So how do you define what a thriving wage is for the arts community? So we actually have that lined out specifically. I hope I say this correctly. We <coughs> currently have thriving wage defined as hourly jobs bet starting between fifteen and seventeen dollars an hour. Okay. Our um, kind of full time salary positions. The range is, I believe, fifty thousand to one hundred and twenty five thousand or so. Is that right? Yep. And then um, management and executive level positions are more in the seventy five to one hundred fifty thousand. So um, what kind of, um, can you give just like a general job description of what the full-time salary positions would be? And would that include benefits as well? It does include benefits. Okay. Yes. So what type of job descriptions generally would fall into that range? There are a lot of operational jobs that okay. are, you know, part of hospitality and front of house operations, you know, working the box office, the retail, <coughs> food and beverage, um, you know, just kind of maintaining the facility itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are also <coughs> some creative jobs that are included in that as well. Of course, there's a lot of creative work to be done uh, mm -hmm. in the work that we do. Uh, so there are positions for, for artists of a wide range in there as well. So when you're looking at Norman, is it going to be a similar model like you have set up at Factory Obscura in Oklahoma City? Or are you looking to, um, I think it's um, more space would be available to you. So I'm assuming 
it would be a larger operation. Is that mm -hmm. a reasonable assumption? That, yeah. that is correct. And okay. it will include more components than we were able to create if at the space in Oklahoma City, um, like food and beverage, potential for food and beverage, um, fabrication and workshop space, mm -hmm. um, classrooms mm -hmm. for community programming. Um, An outdoor grove outdoor that would be a park, filled park that's open and available to public 24-7, mm -hmm. free of charge. So um, I've been really trying to take a little deeper dive into just how your model is set up in Oklahoma City. And, you know, I think like any organization, you've grown from um, when you first had, I believe the words collective that you use, you had a collective of creative people um, and started in, I think you've been in two other locations besides okay. the one that you're in now. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're doing great. You're <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, um, I'm sure um, as you've grown, you know, you you have adapted and, um, you know, maybe changed your employment practices and things like that. And I think, you know, one of the things that really got our attention in the initial conversation that we had was this um, possibility of being able to employ artists. Uh, and so if you could just kind of help me understand what your current model is and how you think that's going to be adapted for Norman. So you have founder, you are the founders, mm -hmm. and then you have, um, and I got this all off your website, so, <laughs> and it's, you have an art design team, and that's 30 people, um, and five of those were founding artists, so I assume means that they've been with you from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. And then um, you also had um, another list of people of contributors, past and present. So people that maybe have come and gone for mm -hmm. any number of reasons. And then you have staff. So um, what, what, where, where are the employment opportunities in your current model with those like founders, art design team, staff? So how does that work? So the staff that are on the website currently, that mm -hmm. list that you were seeing, is our operating staff at okay. State in Oklahoma City. Those are the, the so folks who run the, the nine business. people. Uh huh. Yeah. And so they are running our box office, our gift mm -hmm. shop, main, maintaining the space there. Um, and then the the artist team, that list that you were looking at on mm -hmm. our website, is a group of artists that we work with regularly, mm -hmm. and they are often engaged in all different kinds of projects, depending on what we have going on at that time. Most of those artists are working with us on a contract basis currently, okay. uh, so it's kind of project by project. Um, and you mentioned, you know, as, as we've grown over the last few years that th we've adapted the way that we do things. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we have learned when we started, <coughs> we really thought our goal was to create as many full-time jobs for artists as possible. Okay, that, I think and that is an understanding. a big yeah. goal. But in working with artists and actually starting to provide full-time jobs for artists, we realize that actually a lot of artists prefer the project-by-project project employment because okay. it gives them flexibility to plug into our work and make something big and collaborative in a way that they would never do on their own, and then go take some time to work on their own private practice a little bit, and then come back and do a project with us again later. So it allows them to maintain their personal practice in addition to the work they're doing with Actually Obscura. So we have started to adapt our model to allow for artists to participate in both ways, where they can work with us on a contract basis as their, their creative practice allows, mm -hmm. but also artists who can have full-time jobs with us and work with us in an ongoing way for that stability, uh, depending on how they want to work and work with what works best for them. Yeah. So, um, how many artists do you employ right now? We have one full-time artist employed. We had several more pre-COVID. Of okay. course, COVID changed a lot of things for us that we are still recovering from. Um, but all the art, most of the artists we work with currently are on a contract basis. Okay. So. They are being um, they are being compensated financially in some way. Yes, absolutely. And so, do you have contracts with them? Mm -hmm. or, okay. And so, um, because the other thing that um, you you had mentioned year three, yeah, years three to five, 
that you're estimating, and we understand this is all conceptual at this point, but it's just trying to understand, you know, how this is all going to play out, or at least have a better understanding how it's going to play out, that you're, pro you're projecting that you could possibly employ 70 employees. So would that be a combination of staff, uh, creative design team, um, management staff, mm -hmm. so it would be a combination that would all feed into that number. Um, so I guess the, the, the question for me is anyone who is um, contributing to Factory Obscura, would they be eligible or competing for a paying job? I mean, is everything a paid uh, job, whether it's contract labor or uh, an extended um, full-time job, if you're on the staff, I, I would assume it would be like what we would commonly understand. I don't want to, I don't want to get tripped up on semantics because I think when we talk about full-time jobs, for someone like me who is not in the art world, you know, that means it's you're hired and you have a job unless you want to leave it or you don't you know, you have to leave for some other reason. And I'm not sure that's really how it works in the art world for the reasons that you just eliminate, uh, you know, talked about. So um, so there's a combination of, of paths to being employed as a creative. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And it is very important to us that any time we work with artists, they are paid for the work that they do, whether okay. it's through full-time employment or contract work, we can't pay the artist, we just don't do it. Okay. In our current model, the first three and a half years being um, season design, construction, and installation of the art, the <coughs> large, a large proportion of our employees or contract worker will be uh, artists. As we shift toward the operational mode, um, the the proportions will be reversed. There will be a lot more staff dedicated to the operation proper. But that being said, when we talk about artists, when we hire, most of our employees are artists. They are not hired as artists, if you will. <laughs> so they, they, they serve in a position as a gift shop salesperson, but mm -hmm. she's an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, however, when we call, we're going to hire artists, talk about hiring artists in the quality of artists where their contribution is to, to be paid. And, and that takes uh, different forms too. Uh, there will be a merchandise designer, there will be a uh, marketing um, uh, designers and such. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we will employ a lot. So, um, as you're thinking about the, the Norman model and how you would adapt what you're doing now to how it might apply to Norman, I think one of the concerns that I've heard from constituents in Norman, because we have a pretty vibrant arts community in Norman, and I think there's some concern that, um, you know, they won't, um, that this will have some negative impact on our current art scene in Norman. And one of the things, um, I went back and, you know, we used some of the notes I had from some of our initial meetings, and you um, stated at one of the earlier meetings that um, your intention is not to compete with existing resources that we already have, but to complement. So could you maybe address um, those types of concerns that, that I hear from constituents and, um, if, you know, how, how would a person apply to be employed at Factory Obscura? You know, what, what are you looking for? Um, you know, how, how would you exist side by side and, um, you know, work within the arts community that's already here, if you could address some of those things. Well, first, let's say that we don't have a big enough team to build our next project in Norman without hiring people, and we fully intend to come and hire people in Norman. But our processes have been, it's always an open process that happens online primarily. We send out, you know, we get a notification that we're hiring on the website and in social media. And we get usually at least 100 applications for each job that we post, a lot of interest. And we start coming through because we're looking for certain skills, of course. 
and we start fitting those things together, interviewing people and finding people who we think that we might be able to work with. Um, so that process will be, you know, open and visible, and you know, we're really looking forward to engaging the community here. And in fact, we have artists already from Norman who are on our current team, on our current team, on our current projects. Um, <coughs> so yeah, the other part of it is, yes, uh, we still feel the same way that we did before <laughs> about adding to the resources of the community and not depleting them. And that was a conscious conversation that we had in the very beginning when we started Factory Obscura was about creating new opportunities and making the pie for all of us bigger and not taking away from the, the pie that already exists of funding and resources for art and artists in Oklahoma. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why we formed as a for-profit and not a non-profit, because we don't want to be competing for the same grant opportunities that all of our nonprofit arts organizations are already depending on. We want to create new grant opportunities in the future for artists and arts organizations. You know, part of our mission as a B Corporation is to support arts education. So that is part of our model, is to dedicate some of our <coughs> profits to arts education in the community. Um, so yes, part of our goal is to add to, make, make the community bigger, and more, add more resources. So um, the process to be a part of Factory Obscura in Norman would be an open employment process, an open call for um, the skill sets that you were looking for, so that would be accessible to anybody who wanted to um, apply and, yes. and be a part of it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll come to Norman also with community mixers and artist mixers and, you know, get a chance to, to meet people who are interested in working with us or finding out about the project. Mm -hmm. So we'll make some community opportunities. So, um, just I'm assuming, you know, so we're, we're talking about years three to five with the projected number of 70, but when we first begin, I would assume, just based on what I've learned so far about, you know, what to do, that you would have um, a need for a lot of people up front to start, you know, building your concept and your immersive experience. And so that would be an opportunity for maybe, I don't know, a few months or an extended period of time, but then I'm assuming that would slack off. Mm -hmm. and so, some of those short term. Yeah. yeah. And so, is that made clear? Um, I mean, is that the kind of thing that you make clear with with those that are on your creative team? Mm -hmm. We're hiring you for this period of time. Um, it will likely run three months. It could run six months. I mean, do you have you contracts and that sort of thing that you're using already, so that yeah. artists yeah. understand. Yeah what their compensation is going to be before they ever start? Yes, yeah, yeah, and it always includes a timeline and you know, the payment structure is different depending mm -hmm. on the process, whether it's a flat fee for the project or mm -hmm. an hourly rate or, you know, weekly rate, whatever, mm -hmm. depending on what the project is. Yeah, because I've talked to, you know, um, a few artists that are here in Norman and, you know, there's just a, a lot of ways that they try to maintain a standard of living, and it's hard. Yes. And a lot of artists have full-time jobs, maybe not even related to what yeah. they do. And so having, it, it sounds like there are a lot of different paths and options. That's there right. could be an option for somebody who is really looking and needing a full-time experience like we commonly would understand what that means. But there also are opportunities for what I would call contract labor or short-term um, short term opportunities to be compensated for your work with the understanding this is not a permanent job. Right. right. So do those, that contract labor, are there benefits included with that too, or does it depend on you know, there, there haven't been, and what okay. we are looking at is being able to offer a stipend to cover half of their insurance, mm -hmm. and helping them. We work with an insurance broker who could help mm -hmm. them get, on, get their insurance through the market mm -hmm. place, and then we can come, come in, you know, pay half of their insurance during the time that they're with us. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you are for profit now. I'm assuming you did not start that way. We did. Oh, you did from yeah. the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, have, are you a B corporation now, or we are. okay? 
And could you elaborate on, on what that means? I had to look that up too. <laughs> yeah, it's a relatively new business designation. The state of Oklahoma just started recognizing it in the last couple of years. Um, but the B stands for benefit. So it's, it's a benefit corporation. So we're a for-profit company, but with a social benefit component. So it's almost like a hybrid of a for-profit and a non-profit model. Um, so the real beauty of it is that our community impact mission, the arts education focus that I mentioned, is baked into the structure of the company. So it's not just something that the current founders have as a pet project. If the leadership changes in the future, it's built in. It's not something that future leadership could decide to change. Um, it's part of the company for the life of it. And that was something that really appealed to us, that it's something that's really baked in, investors who come in understand that a portion of our profits are always going to be dedicated to this mission. Um, and it's something that we've talked to others in the field who have set up in this in this way. Um, and so we really kind of followed in that footsteps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating really to learn a little bit more about it. Okay, well thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Council Reformer. <coughs> Can return somehow. Okay, so my question is here our equivalent of like maps is Norman Forward. So mm -hmm. a portion of our hotel sales tax goes to our Norman arts community. Do you receive anything like that from Oklahoma City? And if so, would you need anything like that with Norman? No. We don't, but we would love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we would you open it up to children's field trips? Yes, we, we do that already. Give, uh, free field trips for all public school kids. And then we have lots of other school groups that come that are you know, paying a small, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's five dollars a kid if it's you know a private school or a or a different kind of school group. Um, we actually have a project right now in our lobby that was built by Tara Birdie students mm -hmm. here in Norman. And it's on display in our lobby it's at the next so table right cool. now. It's super cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah. it's super cool. So yeah, that's that's the that is a way that we are able right now to contribute to education, mm -hmm. and we, we do that. That's so awesome. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Councilor <Let's> Studley. <laughs> Um, I think it's awesome that you have the pretty artist yeah. <laughs> in my ward. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do have a few questions. So I, I, I'm the naysayer. So I love art. <laughs> we'll start with that. I love the fact that you guys are willing to work with both OU and Norman Public School students. I think that that's a really great opportunity. Um, however, we ha I have had some constituents reach out to me with concerns from your company, and I know as you grow and develop, you have learning curves and bad things happen. It's just part of it as, of a, as a business. Um, but some of the concerns that were brought up were racism, sexism, reports of misconduct, and specifically here in Norman with the concert of the Flaming Lips and, um, <coughs> and him kind of mocking some of the protesters that were out here because of the Indian headdress that was worn. Um, so how do you guys plan on, because so, what I'm hearing is that the feeling is that some of those issues have gone un unresolved, or if they were resolved, it took a long time for that resolution to happen. So with you coming to Norman and being part of our students, um, both at OU and our public school, how do you guys, how have you banded together to address these kind of issues that you are currently facing, and how do you plan on dealing with those moving forward in the future? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to address your question about our affiliation with the Flaming Lips and Wayne Coyne. We actually don't have an affiliation with them, which is a common misconception. Um, the building that we are in currently in Oklahoma City was previously occupied by them. They rented the building before we did. Uh, and we moved in, there was a slight overlap when we were moving in and they were moving out. and they're Piece that's called the King's Mouth was exhibited in what is currently now our lobby. Okay. Um, that is the extent of our relationship. <laughs> uh, and we do not work with them okay. at this point. Um, they just had an overlap in our building. Um, but a lot of people thought that the Flaming Lips owned the building, and there is sort of a common misconception that they are somehow funders of our work. That has never been the case. Um, so just to address that, that's just a misconception that's frankly not true. 
Um, and then uh, the other issues that you addressed, uh, yes, we work with a lot of people over the last, we've been, we've existed for a little over four years now and we've worked with almost 200 artists. And so with that many people involved, there's bound to be some conflict. <laughs> Um, and we have tried to be as um, proactive in addressing any issues that come to our attention. Um, unfortunately, they haven't always come to our attention as quickly as we would like um, for us to be able to respond. But when they do, we can take an action very directly and very quickly. Um, and we have um, done some trainings with our team. Do you want to talk about some of the trainings we've done? The, the biggest one that we're currently working on is called the Conversation Workshops, and it's a local group here in Oklahoma City um, who designed all of these workshops around having difficult conversations, and especially in the context of racism. Mm -hmm. And so our current staff and artists who we work with have gone through this training, and that's kind of just an ongoing thing that we've committed to. And, and just in general, we're committed to um, collaborating well, and we have a code of collaboration that everyone agrees to. And we have yeah, a push now to really react quickly and make sure that we're responding to things as they happen. Because in this world right now, we all are seeing all of these kinds of issues rise to the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to us to, to be a safe place for, for people who, who want to work with us and who want to enter our space. So we are, it's something that we have to be working on. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then. I know that she had kind of touched on the B Corp, which I'm really excited about. I know part of being a B Corp is providing back to your community, as you guys yeah. said, as well as um, the equity piece of it and the poly piece of it. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and then projection. So I know that you guys plan on eventually employee, employing 70 people here. That's kind of your projections. What are your projections for profit? What do you see yourself in the first? Because I know you said it's going to take at least about three to five years to fully get up and running. What do you see once you're up and running as your projections within the first five years? I believe that uh, your five profits uh, on the 18 million dollar plan. And that's meaning year five, meaning you've built it, it's the first year that you're that's, really open. Yes, it's just from, from Eight today. years, yeah, gotcha, yeah. okay. Uh, this three, year of three, operations, three gotcha. Three and a half yeah. years of uh, construction until we are fully open. And then, um, as, you know, just assuming uh, 500,000 visitors and a current dollar in the project. That's a lot of visitors. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of sales talks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, you had mentioned that in between that time, you guys like to do a lot of events while you're kind of building the space out. Um, so is that something then that you see, like, how did that work in Oklahoma City, or did it? Yeah. Because you really didn't have uh, space. It really did. It was so good. <laughs> it was yeah. so good. We built um, a boom box on the front of our building that you can interact with from the outside. Which okay. Is a 10 feet high, 20 feet wide <laughs> boom box. Okay. Yeah. So it has music, it has video, you come up and push the buttons, and, you know, things happen inside there, so that started drawing people right away. Okay. The building itself where we are is iconic, so that was already there, people coming to take their photos and everything. And then we built and opened our gift shop very early on. So that first summer while we were building inside the building, we had our gift shop open and we had a big summer solstice block party. We um, walked the street, we put in a roller rink, we had just all kinds of fun, cool art activities happening. And we do those events with sponsors um, free and open to the public. So we always have things happening outside our building that people can just come and enjoy without ever you know, buying a ticket or stepping inside the door. That was the next thing I was going to ask. I know you guys deal with a lot of musicians that are here, that are in Oklahoma. Um, so if you guys are building your inside art installation, then I would assume you can have concerts and things like that yeah, outdoors. Yeah, exactly. But you don't charge for those? Those are free that's to right. them? Yeah, Usually the right. outdoor things are free. Cool. Yeah. 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 All right. That's all I've got. Thank Great. you guys. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Councilman Lynn. So, <coughs> these guys ran and raved about what you have going in Oklahoma City. <laughs> I never experienced anything like it, except I just got back from Las Vegas and I got to experience two immersive art experiences. Fantastic. One of them was Vincent or Van Gogh or yeah. something along those lines. I think they have one in Dallas. The other one was the... Uh, Bright lights, it's at the Neon History Museum. Oh, uh -huh. Blown away. So, it'd be awesome to have something along these lines in Norman. And if you're 
bringing in 500 some thousand people and you're taking a what excuse my language a crappy old building now and <laughs> something awesome I don't, I don't see how this so isn't a slam dunk for everybody however we figure it out i'm excited for it i didn't think like they were like you want to go to the van gogh thing whatever i was like oh, i'll go because i didn't have anything to do and then I, it was one of the most amazing things i've ever been to it was awesome Nice. So, I'm all about it. Councilor Peacock? I'll just second that enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, with uh, Council's indulgence, what we'll do is uh, we'll continue the conversation with the folks at Factory Obscura, and uh, sometime right after the first of the year, we'll bring you uh, some proposals on how we will relocate our current operations out of the space uh, and what that timing may look like. So we'll keep you posted every step of the way and stay in constant communication with uh, the folks at Factory Obscura. Thank you so much. Thank we you. welcome any of you to Oklahoma City to visit what we've yeah. already built. Yes. And we'll spend as much time with you as you want to answer all your questions about our company and let you get to know us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Thanks, team. Okay. On to our second <clears throat> item, a discussion regarding status of the FYE 2022 Capital Improvement Program Budget and preparation of the FYE 2023 Capital Improvements Program Budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Kim Kaufman, the Budget Manager. This is Jacob Huckabee, the Budget Technician. And tonight uh, we're going to be giving some updates on the uh, fiscal year 2022 capital project and the capital improvements plan. And then we're going to seek some uh, feedback from the council on some proposed projects for the fiscal year ending 2023. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jacob. All right. Okay, so this first slide is just going to be a couple of important dates as we go throughout this process. Uh, the first one is going to be today. Uh, the next bullet is going to be our next meeting, which is going to be February 15th of 2022. And at this meeting, we're going to discuss uh, all the proposed new projects that we received throughout the process. And then following that, uh, we are going to have a meeting on May 3rd, 2022, where you will review the final proposed plan for fiscal, fiscal year ending 2023. So this slide is just going to kind of give a general overview of where we get these projects from, how we pick them, kind of how we go about setting these projects out. So the, the purpose of this capital improvement plan is going to be to improve the services that the city offers to our public. And we do so by setting these long range master plans that are reviewed by the citizens and they're going to be uh, reviewed and adopted by council. And all the priorities in these uh, short range and long range plans are going to be set by council. And what I mean by the short range is that's going to be the year to year budget that's adopted and the long range is going to be the five year plan following where we schedule out the projects and you can see when the money is coming in for various projects. And um, as always after these are adopted if an emergency like an ice storm comes up or a high priority project like the Imhoff Bridge happens we can go to council and you can uh, allocate those funds as needed. So what is a capital project? Um, a capital project is a project that's usually going to cost more than $100,000. Doesn't have to meet that point to be considered a capital project, but usually they do. Um, they're going to be relatively fixed and permanent in nature, and they're going to have a lifespan of usually more than five years. So this is going to be uh, construction of a new building, refurbishing an old building, or somehow expanding one of our assets. And uh, with these projects, they're usually going to take more than one fiscal year to complete. And so that's why we have a plan <coughs> to schedule out certain funds where if you have a project, the, the first year you adopt might be the design phase, second year might be construction. So that's where you'll see those schedules come into play. So you'll also see in the capital improvement plan um, there's portions for capital outlay, and this is going to be uh, purchasing equipment, um, things like cars, trucks, desks, IT equipment, 
and these are usually going to have a lifespan of less than five years. Could have more, could have less. Um, they're going to be a one-time occurrence, uh, one-time expense usually. They're not going to be scheduled out multiple years. They might be similar year to year, but they're not going to be stretched out over multiple years. Um, So this is just going to be a list of all the funds that are included in the capital improvement plan budget. All these have capital projects in them. Um, the most notable one is going to be the capital fund. It's broken up into two portions, which is going to be the pay-as-you-go portion and the general obligation bond portion. The pay-as-you-go portion is going to be made up of those capital sales tax funds and the general obligation bonds portion is going to be from those big bond projects and programs that we put together. And this is also um, a continuation of the list with the enterprise funds. These are going to be funds where the projects are um, funded through user fees and charges for those services. So they usually won't use um, capital fund sales tax. Uh, this slide is just a um, chart showing where all the revenue for these projects comes from. As you can see on this chart, uh, currently bonds is going to be the largest portion for this fiscal year. Um, this is going to be the 2021 street maintenance bond, 2019 transportation program. All these are going to be in that little uh, piece of the pie. The second largest is going to be the user fees, which makes up all those um, projects for the enterprise funds and then uh, this one is the uh, same year this is going to be where that revenue goes and the expenses the largest portion of this is going to be the buildings and grounds this is going to be the young family building the senior citizen center all these are pretty big projects that's going to be a pretty big portion of where these expenses go and then uh, next we're going to have the transportation section which is going to have bridges, road projects, all these big 36th Avenue widening projects. All of those. So what is the Capital Improvements Fund? So the Capital Improvements one Fund was established in 1976 and it accounts for all the capital projects that are funded by the capital sales tax. And so all these projects are going to go to services that don't have their own dedicated uh, special revenues like the enterprise funds. So how is the capital fund funded? It is funded with a seven-tenths of one percent sales tax, which was set aside by that same referendum in 1976. And all the projects that are approved for construction within uh, those funds are going to be accounted for in that capital improvement fund. So this slide is just going to give a chart showing some general guidelines of how we like to allocate those revenues. This is not a set in stone set of guidelines, but we do like to try to follow that as closely as possible. These were set by a previous council, and so um, something to note going forward that uh, these can be changed by uh, council going forward. And so this slide is the status of the capital fund. Um, as you can see in this PAYGO portion of the capital fund, which is the portion funded by the sales tax, for the next few years, we currently have um, a pretty significant negative balance in the projections and the estimations for new projects. Now, the reason for this is primarily going to be from the 2012 bond program, transportation bond program. And um, I'll go ahead and say we have a slide later on in the presentation where we uh, lay out a plan of how staff wants to tackle that and get this number down to a much more manageable number. So. And uh, now I'll turn it over to our budget manager, Kim Kaufman, to go over some of the project status updates. So please let us know uh, when you have questions and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, some significant projects closed in fiscal year 22. Uh, that means the work is complete and the bills are paid. That's going to be the uh, emergency communication system radio project from our PSST fund that closed in June. There was uh, about 1.1 million left over from that budget and those funds were transferred to the Emergency Operations Center. 
the ADA transition plan, which was sidewalks on the south side of Main Street, sidewalks and trails on 24th Avenue Northeast, and the Legacy Park parking lot. Uh, projects completed in fiscal year 22, and completed means the work is finished, but all the bills have not been paid. Uh, the TMDL compliance and monitoring plan and implementation year five, Asp Avenue parking lot, State Highway 9 multimodal path, 36th Avenue East to 48th Avenue East, Vicksburg storm pipeline replacement, 12th Avenue North e Northeast traffic signal interconnect, Alameda Street to Robinson Street, 24th Avenue East bond project, Creston Way and Schultz stormwater improvements, Legacy Trail extension along 24th Avenue Northwest and 36th Avenue Northwest, sidewalks on Hall Mulder Drive, sidewalks on Stubman Avenue from Robinson to Timberwolf Trail Phase 1. Uh, some projects underway in the current fiscal year. Uh, the Transit Parks Emergency Vehicle Maintenance Facilities up on North Base. Uh, TMDL Compliance and Monitoring Plan Implementation Year 6. Lake Thunderbird TMDL Data Analysis and Plan Update. And TMDL means total maximum daily load. I'm, I can't get much <laughs> into that beyond that. but um, And then the Engineering Design Criteria Update and Green Stormwater Infrastructure Review. Fire Station 9, they're just finishing some miscellaneous small items. And the fire administration building renovation is 85% complete. Porter Avenue and Acres Street intersection, the comprehensive land use and transportation plan update, Merkle Creek channel stabilization, and Imhoff Road Bridge emergency repair project. Uh, Kim, just one quick question. Mr. O'Leary, when do we anticipate a ribbon cutting on the uh, emergency vehicle maintenance facility on North Base? Best guess. Yeah, uh, probably early January. <laughs> We hope to occupy the building in December, to kind of touch and go, lots of uh, you know, end of project items to address, but we're hoping to occupy the building in uh, mid-December, get through the holidays and have a nice uh, cutting. So area. we'll check with council, make sure everybody's available on the calendar date that's selected for that event. It'll be a wonderful ribbon cutting for us. Thank you. And here's an image of that proposed <coughs> project. We're all very excited about that. <laughs> um, projects under construction in the next couple of years, of course, the municipal complex renovation, um, 36 Avenue Northwest, I-35 and Robinson Street, scheduled completion February 2022. I know a lot of us are excited about that. We'll be discussing this project in more detail later. Classen Boulevard sidewalks from Boyd to 12th Avenue, Florida Flo Flood Avenue sidewalks from Gray Street to Acre Street, Porter Avenue Streetscape, Imhoff Creek st Stabilization, the Traffic Management Center, Constitution Street Multimodal Path, James Garner Phase 2 from Flood to Acres, ADA Transition Plan, 24th Avenue Northwest from Main Street to Robinson Street, Phase 1, and then the CIP sidewalks, Alameda Street, Porter Avenue to 12th Avenue Northeast. Uh, transportation stormwater bond program this monster um, of course with Lindsay Street we had some unavoidable cost overruns and staff has worked hard to manage with the rest of the program uh, next on the list of course is the 36th Avenue Northwest Tecumseh to Indian Hills Road and so this slide um, shows staff's plan uh, to fund the deficit um, left over from these projects um, you know, the total bond amount was $42.5 million. The current projections for these projects in the 2012 Transportation Stormwater Bond Program are $48.3 million. And so we have an estimated deficit of $5.8 million. And uh, here you have a staff's plan on how to fund that gap. And we were able to fund the gap, um, or we were able to find solutions to fund the gap um, to $5.8 million. Um, and with council concurrence, you know, staff will submit an agenda item on December 14th to close these projects, the completed projects, and transfer those funds to reconcile this bond program as shown here. Any questions or any? Councilmember Studley? 
I'm completely green about this stuff. So where it says transfer of surplus funds from 2010 and 2016 maintenance bond programs, does that mean that since 2010 we've had $2 million in surplus and since 2016 we've had $1.5 million in surplus hanging out? I'll turn that over to Sean. Yeah, those, those are the dates that the bonds were passed. Okay. So the projects were completed over the years since then. <clears throat> Once the projects have been finally completed, because it's general obligation bond money, you can only use any excess for similar projects. They have to be used for street projects. And what's proposed here is it will be transferred for the, the 2012 projects, particularly for the 36th Avenue and the Alameda projects. Okay, thank you. And just to add to that, Councilor Rostelli, there we'll talk about some more details later, but this is only part of the surplus. So both programs came in under budget, or, or have uh, nearly come in, under budget on the most recent one, 2016 to 2021, um, upwards of 15%. So we're pretty proud of the program, completed every project, and now, as Anthony said, we've got money left over to spend on street maintenance or street reconstruction. What's our total number that we have left over? I think in the 2010 program, this is probably the extent of it, uh, the, two, the uh, two million, which has already been transferred or in process. But in the 2016, we're just now auditing that program. We're just finishing the last projects, and we're looking at uh, upwards of seven million dollars, uh, oh, wow. which is pretty remarkable. That's awesome. All right, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Holman. A couple questions. Just. Uh, Two projects in Ward 7 here, the class, partly in Ward 7, the class and Boulevard, sidewalks, Boyd Street to 12th, thinking that's going to get underway within the next year or so? Well, it's certainly in the next few months. Okay, Council great. It probably, we, we fudged a bit to put it on the construction list. We're, we're anxious to get started. We're just finishing up a few final easements right now. To get okay. Project that's a pretty major area close to campus that doesn't have sidewalks currently, at least not complete on both sides there. And then the Constitution Street Multimodal Path, which is a separate project from our street project. Correct? Right, grant project, ODOT grant project, that's on your next agenda, I think November 30th, is that right, David? Um, and we, we're gonna be looking at uh, matching uh, the local match with some Norman Forward Trail dollars, if, you, if the council concurs. And that will take bids in March and build the project starting in June. And that's south side of Constitution? That's north side. North side north from side. Jenkins to the tracks or all the way to? All the way to Clarkson. Clarkson. Okay, yeah, great. Crossing two bridges and a railroad track. Which is, uh, <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes. Just uh, want to check on that. And then uh, I've, I've asked you multiple times, you've answered very clearly, uh, but for any of our new folks that may not be aware of why the Lindsay Street project was so much over budget, if you could sure. just give everyone that yeah. may not be familiar a brief <laughs> uh, explanation for that. Well, at the risk of oversimplifying, uh, most of it had to do with the, the stormwater portion of the project. We have a pipeline leading from Lindsay Street all the way to uh, the river. The, in, the original intent was to take that pipeline directly into the I-35 right of way, right at the aligning where uh, Lindsay aligns with I-35. After the bond issue was passed by the voters, ODOT rejected that notion, so we had to take a very large stormwater pipeline another mile to the river instead of taking it directly to I-35. It's about a five to seven million dollar increase that wasn't anticipated in the original project. Also had some land acquisition cost increases and some other things, but um, council and staff at that time chose to proceed with all elements of the project as defined knowing that we would be overspending the local share and try to make it up later in the program. Thanks, Sean. You bet. Councilor Peacock. Uh, yeah, in regards to 36th, uh, are we still eyeing infrastructure package dollars to kind of make that thing whole? Uh, yes, sir. We actually were in conversation today regarding the infrastructure package. Um, and actually, there's a bill pending that would give us more flexibility. It's not that we're currently you know, we're oversubscribed in ARPA funding, but they're trying to loosen up rules on ARPA where you can use that for infrastructure as well. We think we're fine programmed with ARPA dollars the way council already has it programmed. And in the broad categories of infrastructure packages, that transportation project for 36 Northwest fits in beautifully. The exciting part about that, I was on a meeting today about the infrastructure bill since it was signed yesterday, if you all didn't catch that. Uh, we don't know how, it's not going to be a direct funding like ARPA and CARES. Right. And so we're waiting on a guide 
that should be in the coming weeks that we'll talk if it's if it's match it's if it's grant if it if there could be some direct funding but what's exciting about and if we can go to the next slide uh is about that project is that bottom bullet point it's just project is shovel ready so ready i think go. even if it is waiting. match funds or anything like that we're ready to go Perfect. so i'm i'm confident as well that that will qualify nicely with the infrastructure bill thank you So 36th <coughs> Avenue uh, is the next project in the 2012 uh, Transportation Stormwater Bond Program. And it <coughs> widens two miles of roadway from two lane to four lane. The new, some new traffic signals, stormwater improvements, continuous sidewalks and accessibility, improves access to Ruby Grant Park. Construction is pending, of course, due to delay in federal match. And uh, like Mayor said, it is, it is shovel ready. The East Alameda Street Bond Project, um, it's also part of the 2012 Transportation Bond Program. It's also shovel ready, uh, the funds to complete this project. There's $1.1 million in the 2012 tra Transportation Bond, and then some surplus funds from the 2016 Maintenance Bond, uh, about $3 million, and then $216,000 from the 2021 Street Maintenance Bond Program. So this is another item with council concurrence. A funding can be allocated and the project can be bid in December for a March construction start. Councilor Hall. Are these the last two projects in the 2012 Bond. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure. Eight, eight yeah. But these are the when we finish these, yeah. you can check that box. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Councilor Holman. Yes. Just, just to be clear, because we've heard stories in the community over the years about why these two projects haven't been done, mainly the 36 project. But just to be clear, we're ready. We've been ready. We've been waiting on the federal government, which was always planned. Uh, I think that's fair, Council Wright. The other key element there is that the process of allocating funds or ranking projects in the metropolitan area changed midstream uh, just a few years ago. And so projects like this were pretty automatic for us over the last 20 or 30 years, and they become much less automatic in recent years. These two projects are the casualties of that change in ranking and rating process. So the city of Norman, though, we've done everything we can possibly do to get these projects done already. We have, and it's, again, shovel ready. Uh, and the other key point I think it's lost on some folks is our share, the bond funds that our voters approved are in the bank. We're ready to right. do our share. We just are missing the other 80%. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Yes. So this is an overview of the 2019 transportation bond program and our project managers have done an excellent job of managing these costs and you can see that we have excess funds in most of these projects currently. And then the, of course the funds, the excess funds will be utilized to fund future 2019 transportation bond program pod projects. So this is uh, the Porter Avenue and Acre Street intersection, part of the 2019 transportation bond program. Um, they're going to add turning lanes, pedestrian sidewalk improvements, streetscape improvements, safety and sight distance improvements, a new signal at the intersection. Uh, construction slated to begin November 20. Well, I guess it already has begun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're looking to complete construction next month. So this is a $3.3 million cost. Council Hall. So December 2021. Mr. O'Leary? Absolutely. I, I'd like to tell you we are days away from finishing. You'll start to see striping and some other signs of finishing. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are a victim of the supply issues. Mm -hmm. So all of our traffic signal projects are sitting on a boat in Long Beach. <laughs> we think I'm kidding, but they're starting to come in. And literally the traffic signal, which is the, the foundation of that project, is not here yet. <laughs> Steel pole. <laughs> we hope it'll come next week. That's our latest projection and so we'll see the, the final stage which is the signal portion going up next week we hope. so we're very close very close and planning a ribbon cutting for congratulations a quarter, I think. <laughs> I don't know if we do a ribbon cutting. I don't know if we've ever done a ribbon cutting for a street there. project. We'll 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 we need the ribbon cutting for Porter and for the Inhofe Bridge. Yep, we did it look like the finish line kind of a thing? Yeah. We, uh, we did a ribbon cutting for the first of the 2012 projects that was finished, which was Cedar Lane. Yeah. And that was the first new street to have bike lanes in Norman. So 
we had a ribbon cutting with the county commissioners and Sean, and we both we had the podium and everything down there. Closed the street down. We got in the middle of the street and cut the ribbon in the middle of the, and then that was it. Well, that street bridge. So, the bridge. Yeah. Since Porter's mostly closed, we can have a little street party <laughs> where yes, we take all those barricades away. Right. <laughs> It's open. Yeah, they open. Yeah, they open. Yeah, they open. Yeah. I, I mean, drive it. it every day, and I almost had tears of joy, and my mom <laughs> told me what a nerd I was. So. All right, yep. continue, please. <laughs> so next in the 2019 transportation bond program is the Porter Avenue streetscape. It's decorative lighting, pedestrian ADA improvements, decorative concrete sidewalks, a new bus stop, placemaking gateways and landscaping. Uh, construction slated to begin uh, next summer and hopefully will end a year later and this is a 4.2 million dollar cost so James Garner Avenue phase 2 Acre Street to Flood Avenue this was uh, from a Norman Ford and federal grant and this is decorative lighting a new bridge over Robinson Street an extension of Legacy Trail landscape median limited access express route to downtown and this is slated to begin uh, next summer to be completed the following summer this is a 6.3 million dollar cost uh, the I-35 and Robinson Street West Side UNP TIF project this is another <laughs> Uh, celebrated project and everybody can't wait for this to be finished but this was funded uh, two million from the University of North Park TIF and then there was a four million federal match for a total of six million this started in April of this year and uh, we hope construction will be complete by February in just a few months um, Norman's surface transportation program slash surface transportation block grant program and Sean touched on this briefly a minute ago but it's uh, of course our objective to maximize federal funds to match our revenues and staff works hard to secure these funds we compete for these funds with other cities and of course like Sean mentioned we were hit with a major formula change on how those funds were awarded in recent years so red um, uh, outlines the funds that we've secured through fiscal year 23 and yellow is what we hope to apply for um, beginning in fiscal year 2024 so next uh, is a summary of the fiscal year ending 2016 to 2021 street maintenance bond program uh, these projects have been have been completed on time and under budget and the surplus must be used for street maintenance and staff has some proposals listed here for the surplus and funds and their proposals are 1.5 million to the 2012 transportation bond program as we discussed 3 million to east alameda bond project and 2.4 million for additional street maintenance in neighborhoods Uh, so this is our new uh, fiscal year ending 2021 street maintenance bond program that the voters approved uh, this past April and uh, we're well underway with this program questions oh, sorry councilor Schuler sorry we're back one slide that 2.4 million um, from surplus from 2016 um, that's going to go additional to street maintenance in neighborhoods. Do we have a, a list of that, or is that as things come up in neighborhoods, like issues? Sure. Yes, we always like? have a list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know There's you have a list. There's always more to do, but that's really why we're here tonight, to ask you if you uh, agree in this approach. We're not presuming that we're going to do any of these things until council approves them. So if you concur in this approach with the $6.9 million surplus, that to transfer some of that to the 2012 bond program, transfer some of that to East Alameda, then there would be 2.4 left over. And we would then bring for you a, a program of new neighborhood projects using our pavement management system to select those streets. Okay, perfect, yeah. thank you. So these are three projects uh, that are slated to um, be in this uh, 2021 street maintenance bond program. Classen Boulevard, Van Buren Street, and Franklin Road. Uh, this is another item that we're looking uh, 
for council consensus on. These are recurring sidewalk projects that we're proposing for fiscal year ending 2023. Um, and, and these projects normally recur or receive this recurring funding. Uh, Public Works is asking for a $50,000 increase to the city sidewalk project funding that, that has been 50,000 annually in the past. Uh, but it'd be 80,000 for schools and arterials, um, 30,000 for um, sidewalk accessibility, 100,000 for citywide sidewalk project. That's the citywide 50-50 repair, um, 50,000 for downtown area sidewalk projects, 120 for sidewalks and trails, and then 40,000 for the horizontal saw cut program. I just mentioned that the resolutions that we passed at the last meeting from ACOG were helped us sup supplement some of these things because there's so much to be done in our community. So I think it's it's awesome that we're doing so much and still trying to get more funds to address them. Councilmember Hall. Yeah, I want to particularly highlight the citywide sidewalk project and the 5050 repair program. I know that's been enormously popular. Um, so could you just briefly address you know the history of it that we've i mean i'm i'm pretty sure we've spent every single dollar every year and the the more that residents are aware that this program is available the more applications you're seeing to participate i think certainly i think that we've been very successful this year yeah uh this is the probably the largest amount that we've ever spent in this program mm -hmm. uh we've been very active and going back to some of the older pro problems have been outlying out there that have been kind of sitting still mm -hmm. bringing those back up We've also been able to go after some a little bit larger projects, usually the Triangle Fraternity and their issues, uh, where those sidewalks are just completely damaged. That was a larger project than we normally wouldn't have been able to do. But this year we did come to council and we asked if we could please transfer some money around within our sidewalk programs to bring another forty-five thousand dollars in, because we'd already expended our fifty thousand for the year, and this was about two months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year, something else we've been much more proactive about is that 50% match that comes from the citizens. We've been coming to you and asking if we can transfer that money back into the program. So we've actually been reinvesting that money back in. So when you look at our total expenditures on this, we're going to well exceed $100,000 by December, so in six months. Mm -hmm. And it has been very active. Uh, we do see, I think that we're seeing more sidewalk complaints in the past two years than we have in the previous years. Mm -hmm. And I think it is because people are seeing success and being able to report their problems and us being able to go out and address them quickly and accurately. Um, many of these projects are being completed within 30 to 45 days from their initial report. So we're, we're decreasing that time frame by being very proactive with it and also being able to go out there and really work with a lot of citizens. We had a couple of complaints with more of a neighborhood area, two or three blocks in a neighborhood, and we went out, we canvassed those, we marked them all down, and then we were able to go out and address each one of those and work with those property owners individually to get their 50-50 opportunity to, to utilize this program. So I think that we've seen a lot of improvement in the program, mm -hmm. but I think we've also seen a lot more usage by the, by the citizens of Norman as they've become more aware of this program. And it's amazing, it used to be we get the phone call that my sidewalk is broken, you need to come fix it, and we'd say, well, okay, well, that's your responsibility, but we have a program, and it used to be that, that was a, a point of contention. It seems like lately it's more like, oh, really? So I can get some help to pay for this. Um, we're even in some instances working with the property owner if they're having issues with being able to pay the amount. We're looking at it individually and, and trying to address what we can do to help any any issue we can to make sure we have ADA compliant sidewalks. Well, thank you. Um, this is literally one of my favorite programs that we run in the city of Norman. And I think most residents are surprised that the sidewalk is their responsibility. So once you get past that, educational piece of why that is having this available to um, reduce the shock value of what it's going to take and the fact that they don't have to go hire anybody to do the work we are at the ready and prepared to do that work so I am in complete support of finding whatever changes <coughs> under the couch to pour back into the city sidewalk project I mean it's acutely um, apparent in Ward 4 of the continued need, but this is all across the city, anywhere in the city of Norman. Yeah. So thank you. I really you. appreciate all your work and how proactive you have been <coughs> on this program. So thank you for that. Councilmember Studley. I, I touched on a question about if, if 
it's a 50 50 split you guys provide the contracting work all that mm -hmm. stuff so literally the citizen just has to pay the other half of the bill and split that cost to the city that's correct so we reach out to them we send them a, an official letter we try to reach out to them and contact them <coughs> by phone or in person we'll actually go knock on doors and then we if we ha if it's by letter in that letter we say it's this cost if you pay this amount we'll pick up the rest we do give them the option of trying to find their own contractor. We have, we've had several people say, I can get it done cheaper, and they call back in about three weeks and go, so, can we use your contractor? Uh, it's very hard to find contractors right now, and they find out that really because we're leveraging $400,000 worth of work with one contractor, that our unit cost is so much more effective than what right. they can do. But yes, that's exactly it. They, we do go out. And really, they just send a check and wait for the work to get done. They don't really have to do anything. And then we work with them, all, of course, while we're at their residence or at their business <coughs> to make sure that whatever needs to be done to make sure that their site is left as it was found. We work nice. with that also to make sure it's done correctly. Good deal. Thank you so much. Okay. Councilmember Holman? I'll just mention real quick that, in my opinion, the uh, horizontal saw cut program dollar for dollar is maybe one of the best mm -hmm. investments that we've made definitely in the time I've been on council um, the results are visible and extending the life of old sidewalks and making them ADA compliant and for the cost um, I'm, that's it's been an amazing program and I'm hoping we continue that and maybe increase it in the future So the bridge maintenance program. Um, historically, we've allocated about $100,000 um, in fiscal year 21. We increased this to $500,000. And of those funds, about 20% is for design and 80% is for construction. Um, completed in fiscal year 21, we've got these bridges here, 156th Avenue Northeast, West Rock Creek Road, West Brook Street, East Boyd Street, 72nd Avenue Southeast, and Concord Drive. Uh, completed in fiscal year 22 is 48th Avenue Southeast and Cedar Lane Road. <clears throat> the Imhoff Road Bridge em Emergency Repair, originally identified for maintenance in the 22 Bridge Maintenance Program, scheduled to be complete in March of 22. The proposed uh, bridge replacement bond program, uh, 77 bridges in Norman, 15 bridges need full repla replacement, 12 bridges are structurally deficient, 4 bridges are functionally obsolete, 3 bridges are at risk of becoming structurally deficient, 6 bridges have load postings of less than 23 tons, the total program cost is 40 to 50 million, and this is a 10 year construction program. I'll throw in again the infrastructure bill. 60% of it is for roads and bridges. So I'm glad that we are putting together scope and cost estimates because, I mean, you know what's coming down the pike. And when the guide comes out, we got a lot of work to do. Councilor Schuler. Yeah, I was just kind of going to touch on all of that. We've been talking about this since um, Imhoff road bridge went out um, and we had to you know figure out how we were going to emergency <laughs> repair that bridge um, and you know talking about how are we going to only use five hundred thousand dollars a year which is currently allocated to maintain these bridges um, or you know replace and repair um, but looking at these numbers, it's really dire. And so just continuing to reiterate all the conversations that we've had since um, that bridge on Imhoff Road went out, um, that we really need to think about a, a, a program, maybe like our street maintenance program. What does that look like? We've been so successful with our streets. Why can we not think about doing this with our bridges? Um, it's really critical. And then to Mayor's point about thinking about utilizing this incoming infrastructure money um, to start kind of getting some of these big scale projects off the ground quickly. So, Councilmember Schuler, the, the fact that we've been talking bridges and we, we're in similar uh, position on stormwater projects with $65 million worth that we can roll out in a very efficient, um, very well, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, and we've got plenty of pictures. So I think we will be dangerously competitive uh, in the infrastructure world, depending on how they decide to distribute uh, on bridges and uh, stormwater projects as well. Yeah, I just appreciate staff's diligence with all of this and having all of this ready to go so we have it ready. 
as this infrastructure money comes in. Councilor Hall. Yeah, I just want to add my support for that too. We've had a lot of conversations, painful conversations about um, the dire need for um, our bridge replacement program. So I'm really going to stay optimistic that we're going to have some success with the infrastructure bill, but I also think we're probably going to need more <laughs> and definitely support exploring a similar kind of bond proposal because I believe our residents would support something like that. And as I covered today, it's not about, you know, catching up, it's avoiding failed bridges yeah. at this point. Okay. So, yeah. okay, any other questions about the bridge? Okay, continue please. So as uh, Daryl and the mayor pointed out, um, other potential funding sources would be uh, the ARPA funds from the state once, if they pass that bill, that kind of relaxes those spending restrictions. Um, and then this uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, they're supposed to allocate $266 million to Oklahoma for bridge replacement and repairs over five years. So as they said, we're waiting on the details of this. So future traffic signals. Um, 31 signals have been identified through traffic studies. Nine in yellow are on Oklahoma Department of Transportation controlled road roadways. 22 in white are on city controlled roadways. And many have traffic impact fees collected from development. So that's a source of revenue for this. Councilor Holman? <clears throat> yes, uh, on this list, there's two of them I don't see that I have been under the impression that we were working on. Uh, Post Oak and Highway 77, and then Highway 77 and High Meadows. I don't see on this map, but I know yeah, Mayor Clark and multiple Ward 6 council members have had issues with the High Meadows. But I do recall, I thought we have a Wait, Post Oak. Program. We'll check on that. Okay. You're exactly right. They're on, they're on our work program. Okay, thank you. If I may, Mayor, I, I asked staff to put this together for you tonight. We've done this in the past years, but just we get inquiries from you all about traffic signals. Is there can we get one here or there? We had one recently in Ward 2 on Maine and <coughs> Wiley, which wasn't on this list. But part of our point here is to say that we are always looking out um, the, the project in Ward 1, the Summit Lakes and Alameda traffic signal project was born in 2001. 2001 when Summit Lakes addition was first platted and approved by council, we identified that someday we might need a traffic signal at the intersection. 20 years later, we're installing a traffic <laughs> signal. So these things have a long life. We're trying to plan out ahead and, and know when we might need some help with traffic, but it takes many, many years sometimes. Sometimes they never qualify, and sometimes we don't get the funding. So we're always happy to add new ones and, and explore new ones, but realize that you've got 31 pending that are unfunded today, and they're, they're probably going to be needed sometime in the future. Average cost of a traffic signal, two hundred to $250,000 put that in perspective. Thank you. So another proposed project um, is the city vehicle wash facility. Uh, the annual cost to wash the city vehicles is about $100,000. Uh, reduced operation, this would reduce operational costs for city departments. And then there are also environmental impacts of vehicle <coughs> washing. Um, the estimated construction cost of this uh, vehicle wash facility is about $1.5 million. And uh, currently Norman Utility Authority um, has $540,000 in funds for wash facility. Um, we have an estimated uh, $480,000 from the Federal Transit Authority. And if we were to receive those, we would need to uh, come up with $480,000 from our own funds to match that. And the wash facility will be located at North Base. We're also working on a feasibility study to develop the new North Base Master Plan uh, or the Public Works and Utilities Facilities Master Plan for th the design of this area. Is that environmental impacts? Are we looking at like impotable water where, you know, we can come in and... Frankly, Mayor, a lot of times we're washing our vehicles on a parking lot now and that water is, uh, and, and maybe uh, substances are going into the stormwater system. We shouldn't be doing that. We need a facility that has a stormwater or a sanitary sewer collection system like these do. I want to highlight here that uh, the reason we're really pressing on this now is that now we run a bus system. Uh, we wash our buses, Washington, our buses every night now. When we move into our new facility next month, we won't be able to do that. 
uh, we think that's a shame. We, we need to do a better job of cleaning our buses. And so going to a, a bus wash every two or three weeks, we think is really not going to be suitable. We need a wash facility for the buses, and we've needed a wash facility for our other 800 vehicles for a long time. Most cities have one of these 20 or 30 years ago. This is something that the city has put off a long time, and, and I think it's the transit system that really is going to drive our immediate needs. Uh, and we have a place for it. The little green box there on the map is where we've uh, sited this location next to our two new facilities and next to many of the existing uh, city facilities where a lot of the vehicles uh, live uh, throughout the, the, uh, uh, the day. This is also our fueling facility, so all these vehicles come into this location at various times throughout the week. And anyway, it's something we'd sure like to find that, that 480 this year, preferably if we can, to get this project going. But right now, it's it's not fully funded. If I may answer the mayor's question, I was kind of looking around at this question. But, but he did talk earlier that, about the possibility that there are some um, non-potable water wells in the area that we could pipe to, <coughs> to, to use for this facility. So we did want to kind of find out from council if it's okay for you all to proceed with this possibility. I'm trying to find that $480,000. Okay, we'll have, we have about five more minutes to give us a break before the hearing. Um, and if we, what we don't get through, which I don't think we're going to get through, we are going to cover in finance on Thursday. Uh, next is the city fleet fueling facility. Um, construct and register with the Oklahoma Corporation Commission 1998. Fiberglass reinforced underground storage tanks. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Life expectancy and warranty 30 years. Uh, fuel storage 10,000 gallons of diesel and 10,000 gallons of unleaded. And then dispenses 500,000 gallons of fuel annually to se over 793 city vehicles and pieces of equipment. And the challenges are the fuel line encasements have failed, allowing groundwater to lay on top of the pumps. Critical repairs are needed in the next three years at about $350,000 to $500,000. Alternative fuels such as ethanol and biodiesel are not available due to lack of tanks. Limited tank storage capacity for growing fleet. No option for bulk diesel exhaust fluid. Fuel islands are deteriorating and the replacement cost is $1.65 million. And that's for all of those things? I believe so. Total price tag. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the um, picture of the projects that are underway or planned along State Highway 9. We've completed a um, continuous paved roadway of four lanes with sidewalks and bike lanes from 24th Avenue to 72nd, and then 72nd to 108th Avenue is under construction currently. The city vehicle replacement program, Sean, of course, will tell you that a city our size should be spending at least $4 million a year on vehicle replacements, but we haven't been able to do that with all the other capital equipment needs that the city has. So when these vehicles are replaced, they are truly on their last legs. And in the current fiscal year, we spent about $2 million. That's about our average over the last few years. Our need is much higher than that. Um, Especially so it, if it hails, just. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> I was going to say we didn't have a, a hail repair facility <laughs> for those 793 holes <coughs> built in either. The rate we're going. We're going to stop now. I think yeah. that's a good time. All right, we'll go ahead and adjourn now. We'll begin the public hearing at 6:30, and again we will finish this overview <coughs> at finance at 4 o'clock on Thursday.
Good evening, and welcome to the City Council Special Meeting of November 16th, 2021. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Sedley? Here. Councilmember Schuler? Here. Councilmember Lynn? Here. Councilmember Hall? Here. Councilmember Tortorella? Here. Councilmember Foreman? Here. Councilmember Holman? Here. Councilmember Peacock? Here. Mayor Clark? Here. Thank you. Item one is the public hearing on a resolution recommending ward boundary changes from the reapportionment ad hoc committee meeting. This item is for the public to have an opportunity to submit comments to council regarding the proposed recommendation from the reapportionment ad hoc committee on the changes in ward boundaries. The public hearing is not for council questions or comments. Council questions and comments will take place after the public hearing is closed in item two. I need a motion to open the public hearing. The motion on the floor is to open the public hearing. Council members, you may cast your votes. All votes have been in the public hearing passes unanimously. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize Catherine Walker, our city attorney, and Joyce Green, our GIS services manager, to make a presentation on behalf of the reapportionment ad hoc committee. Thank you. Do we have the slides up? Okay, so I'll go over just a little bit of the process and the rules that the reapportionment committee and council uh, follows. You find those provisions in the city charter, you find them in state law, and then there's case law under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the Federal Voting Rights Act, and then various court cases that sort of inform our process. Um, so under the charter, the reapportionment committee is appointed to meet and review and make recommendations on war boundaries in three situations when the city proposes to annex or de-annex property upon the unanimous recommendation of council or as a result of the census. The committee has one representative from each ward and one uh, at-large representative. And their charge is to form, to look at the population of the city based on the census and form wards that are equal as nearly as practicable in population, not registered voters, not registered members of a political party, but in population. The charter also says each ward should be formed of compact contiguous territory with boundaries drawn to reflect and respond to communities of common interest, ethnic background and physical boundaries to the extent reasonably possible. Ward lines shall not create artificial corridors, which in effect separates voters from the ward to which they most naturally belong. The commission holds a public hearing. They uh, met after the public hearing. The charter says they have to wait 10 days to meet. Uh, they did that, met, and then have forwarded this recommendation to council. Previous charter language gave council limited options with this, uh, their action from the commission or from the committee, but for the first time, we're using new charter language that was uh, recommended back in 2013, so that council has the, several options here uh, as this recommendation comes forward. The same rules apply to council, uh, so, you know, it has to be uh, equalized as nearly as practicable, formed of compact contiguous territory and all of those things I, I went through just a minute, a minute ago. Um, and council tonight will have the option to listen to what the public has to say about the reapportionment committee's recommendations and then determine whether they want to follow those recommendations, whether they don't want to change the wards, which is not an option we're recommending and I'll explain that in a minute. And, or, uh, recommend or bring forward um, different boundaries from what the committee has recommended. So when you look at um, the rules for reapportionment and you look at all of the case law across the country, the standards you find in the charter and in state law are very similar to what you find across the country. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that population equality is the paramount objective of apportionment, one person, one vote. Uh, a lot of people uh, have probably heard of that phrase. That is a means of protecting voters, not elected officials. Now, the Supreme Court says when you're drawing wards, you can deviate from that absolute population equality to accommodate your districting objectives, like maintaining communities of common interest and creating geographic compactness. But if you deviate more than 10%, your, your maps may be invalid. And so that is something that the committee really worked with to try and keep these deviations between wards 
uh, and no more than 10% um, to try and uh, keep compliant with that. We do have a lot of diverse interests in Norman, a lot of diverse areas in Norman. Unfortunately, because of the population spread, it's impossible to get all of those interests in one ward that's contiguous uh, and that is equal in population. So the committee tried to uh, form those boundaries in a way uh, that made sense to the committee. There is more than one right answer, I'm certain. There are a lot of options here, and so uh, you'll hear that, I think, from the, from the uh, public about uh, other suggestions where, where those lines could be drawn, but these are the rules uh, uh, in front of you that would need to be followed regardless. State law says do not split precincts where possible, and our charter says that as well. The challenge, of course, is that they are also redrawing their boundaries, and they have not completed those new boundaries, uh, so we don't know absolutely where those precincts will, will be. So the commission or the committee was provided with current precinct boundaries uh, when looking at reapportionment. So this is the process to date. The committee was appointed in January of 2021. The data would normally, by federal law, come out, I think, in April. Uh, but because of COVID, it didn't come out until August, and the committee immediately started meeting a couple weeks later. Uh, they had two regular meetings, came up with boundaries that um, were substantially equal in population, and took that forward to a public hearing on September 27th. After the public hearing, they met in a regular meeting and decided to move forward with the original recommendation. And now we're here tonight uh, for the public hearing on that recommendation before council. Going forward, uh, as I said tonight, you'll have the option of adopting a resolution that doesn't change the boundaries, a resolution that would, that would um, change the boundaries in the way the committee recommended, or a resolution adopting a change in boundaries, um, however council sees fit tonight. That doesn't change the boundaries in and of itself. That resolution is required by uh, our charter, but we do have to change boundaries by adoption of ordinances and state law requires a 30-day published notice before an ordinance can be adopted. So that gives us first reading on December 14th, and then second and final reading on January 11th. We'll publish that 30 days notice uh, in advance of that consideration. Ordinances do not go into effect for 30 days after their date of adoption. So this ordinance would go into effect on February 10th and would not impact the current terms of council members or the 2022 council elections. And now I'll turn it over to Joy Screen, our GIS guru, mm -hmm. who knows this mapping software better than I do. All right, so I am going to present the map on behalf of the committee. We're just going to go through each ward and look at the changes. At the beginning of the process, the total deviation among the wards was 27 0.41%, which is well outside of the 10% needed to have our maps be valid. So the committee did need to undertake reapportionment. So at that point, I'm going to, we use the total population, as Catherine said, to draw up this map. So the proposed ward, well, the starting population of Ward 1 was 15,018. The starting deviation was 6.16, which sent 23 people to Ward 5 and gained 1,088 from Ward 7 to have an ending population of 16,083 with an ending deviation of 0.5%. Ward 2 was one of our lower wards. It started with a population of 14,845. It had a starting deviation of negative 7.24. It received 1,912 people from Ward 8 for an ending population of 16,757 and an ending deviation of a positive 1.47. Ward 3 was also one that was started out fairly low. It received its Initial population was 14,824. Its starting deviation was a negative 7.37. It sent 135 people to Ward 8 
and received 2,254 from Ward 8. Its ending population was 16,943 with an ending deviation of 5.87. Ward 4 was our lowest ward. It started with a population of 14,129 and a starting deviation of 11.71. It received 1154 people from Ward 7, 614 from Ward 8, and ended up with an ending population of 1,500. 897 with a negative, did I say it wrong? 15,000, 15, sorry, 15,897 and an ending deviation of negative 0.66. Ward 5, while well, it looks like it started out fairly well, it, it was really impacted by other moves. It has a starting population of 16,610 with a starting deviation of 3.79. It sent 1,294 people to Ward 6 and gained 23 from Ward 1 for an ending population of 15,339 and an ending deviation of negative 4.15. Ward 6 was one of our larger wards. It had a great deal of development over the last um, decade. It started out with a population of 18,515 and a starting deviation of positive 15.7. It gave 5268 people to Ward 8 and received 1,294 from Ward 5 and 803 from Ward 5 for an ending population of 15,344 and an ending deviation of negative 4.2. Ward 7 was also fairly high and it basically gave up population to Ward 1 of 1,088 and to Ward 4 of 1,154 for an ending population of 16,000, 0, 16,067 and an ending deviation of positive 0.4. And Ward 8 was changed a lot because it was um, bounded by a lot of wards that had really low populations. So it was the place where it was most logical to give population to, and that's also why it had to go so far over into Ward 6. So it had a starting population of 15,776 with a starting deviation of negative 1.42. It gave 1,912 people to Ward 2. It gave 2,254 people to Ward 3. It gave 614 people to Ward um, 4. It gave 803 people to Ward 6 and took 135 from Ward 3 at 5,268 from Ward 6 for an ending population of 1,500 or 15,596 and a total ending deviation of negative 0.54 or negative, sorry, negative 2.54. So, so in the end, the to over total deviation in the plan was 10.02. And this is just a summary map that shows all of the changes. And if I can jump in here for a minute. I did want to address, and I meant to address this earlier, uh, some things that we heard at the prior public hearing uh, that I wanted to clarify. Uh, I think several people said two or three council members would lose <coughs> their 
or would be moved out of ward by virtue of these recommendations, <coughs> and that's not correct. Uh, only one council member would be impacted. Um, and of course, this doesn't impact current terms and it won't impact the 2022 elections. The committee never received uh, the addresses of council members. I, in fact, don't know where all of you live, so I did not know it impacted a council member until later in the, in the uh, reapportionment process, but uh, we did not give them precinct results or anything like that, so it was really just a function of using this software that, that council will have an opportunity to look at as well. And, and trying to get the numbers right. Thank you. Okay, this is the opportunity for members of the public to make comments on this item. Comments are limited to three minutes or less. We do have public comments, we have some signed up. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please start reading names? Uh, the first one would be Michael Blunk. Punk Ward 2. Um, you know, I just wanted to come and basically just explain that I, I looked over this earlier, and as a member of the public at large, I don't have any issues with the current changes. I feel they all make sense considering the general growth of population we've had. Um, I, I know there's some concern around, you know, Ward 8 being impacted, but beyond that, I, as far as I can tell, at least from Ward 2, it seems fine for a change. In fact, I'm kind of actually surprised that with the growth we've had in Norman that we were able to keep the boundaries pretty much, I mean, things are changing, but it, I was kind of surprised that we were able to keep the population centers as consolidated as possible as we have. So personally, I think it's fine. I don't see any issues with it, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Teresa Elam. Teresa, and I think you all know how I feel about it, um, but I just wanted to reiterate, I think Ward 5 showed up. I think Ward 5 is unhappy. None of us out there feel like we were listened to. Um, when the committee went back, they immediately went to a vote. They didn't discuss it. Uh, they didn't consider any of our claims. You started out with Ward 6 and 7 that were way over and Ward 4 way under. I think the lines could have been changed with minimal impact to the way the wards currently were. And I want to also stress that your agricultural zoned wards definitely are a community. We feel strongly together. We're, we talk to each other. We support each other. And um, the other and last thing point that I want to make, in the 2010 census, Ward 6 was 21% rural. And that number, I'm sure, is less than that before this proposed boundary. Ward 5 is 80, was 87%. We are a rural community, and um, I don't know, we're important. We're important to Norman, and we can benefit each other, and we just want to be heard. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Karen Goodchild. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak with you tonight. Um, our charge, as you heard, is each ward should be formed of compact contiguous territories with boundaries drawn to reflect and respond to communities of common interest to the extent reasonably possible. Ward lines shall not create artificial corridors which in effect separate voters from the ward to which they most naturally belong. I feel that this war, this new map, especially Ward 6 going out to Little River, is a corridor. This area is owned zag, zoned ag, and I feel that is a community of interest that was not listened to. I tried in every meeting for the residential area um, near in Ward 5 near Highway 9 to be moved over to one or to seven to see what the numbers were, and that was denied every time. I don't feel that we explored all the ways that that could be reflective uh, of our charge that's, that you heard tonight. Five, 
uh, was at 3%, 8 was at 1.42. I am not sure why we moved so much stuff around that ended up diluting our farmland and our zoned ag. Our chair said that the ag community was not a community of interest, and I will disagree with that. Our ag community has different needs than Core Norman. They're not better, they're just different. People in, in these areas, we have dumped pets that we cannot get animal control to come and take care of. We have people that have to own a tractor to grade their own road. We live with well water and septic system, and there are many people particularly in Ward 5, that do not even have internet service. So that is a community of interest because we all have similar issues that I, I would like for the council to take into account because it was not heard in our meeting. We, afterwards, we had a discussion after the public comments, and the chair immediately went and asked for a vote I do not feel that the constituents in Ward 5, that their voices were heard. Why should they come to the council meeting and address if they weren't addressed by our committee? I, I just hope that the council goes and looks at some of the residential areas in Ward 5 that have been asked to be moved to a more residential neighborhood. Thank you. Tom Hackelman. Tom Hackelman, I'm a resident of Ward 5. Um, as you've already heard this evening already a couple times, Ward 5 is, consists of the salts of the earth portion of the city of Norman. We're great people, a great section of the community. While we don't necessarily argue the need for reapportionment, what we cons are concerned about most specifically is the process that was used. Consistently, the voices of Ward 5 are silenced and unheard. This has been a consistent problem before I even moved to Ward 5 or as I moved there. This was something I consistently heard from across the ward. The other thing is that when a, a, a significant plan was put before the committee that could help address the issues pertaining to Ward 5, that voice was once again silenced. And instead, the majority at that time speaking about Ward 5 was focused specifically on the dangerous council member on war, for Ward 5 and how dangerous this person is to the city of Norman and specifically Ward 5. Our challenge and our concern is that while our voices continue to be unheard, this smacks of gerrymandering. This smacks of abuse of power, for lack of a better way of putting it. This was a hand-selected committee by the mayor to achieve a sim single purpose, to achieve the plans that she had in place to help restructure the lines and position this so that we would no longer have dangerous council members. The bottom line is votes matter. While I may not have voted for our council member, he is our council member. That's the bottom line. If you want a different candidate, if you want a different representative, select a better candidate and get out there and campaign correctly. This process did not work, and we need to revisit it. So I would urge the committee, urge the council rather, to have the committee go back, revisit this plan, make sure that all the voices are heard, and that we have a, favor, a, a good plan that makes sense for the city of Norman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Fred Pope. Pope, Ward 5, 1501 Navajo Road. Comrade Mayor and uh, Council Members, I believe we have had a very bad problem for the last at least two years 
with Marxist influence promulgated and promoted by you, the mayor, with, through Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, Ken, uh, Jamil Kendi, and this whole reapportionment has been very sadly uh, abused. It is as if, as the preceding speaker mentioned, you were trying, uh, using the Marxist ideal that the end justifies the means to use these nice straight lines to eliminate districts for two of the people who were elected with the help of Unite Norman, which was generally, as you know, also opposed to you. This, again, I would reflect what the previous gentleman said. This should be sent back to the committee for a redo. Thank you. Thank you. M Maggie Logue. <coughs> I'm Maggie Logue. I live in Ward 5. I'm pretty sure that all of you have already made your decision as to what you're going to vote for for this reapportionment committee, the recommendations. It really disappoints me because what that says to me is that you all don't care what your constituents are saying. And that's a problem. I don't have a whole lot to say, but I want to point out a few things. In Word 3, their potential voting is going to increase by two. 1,119 people. That's according to those numbers up on that map just above it. Word 5 is down by 1,271. And Elizabeth Foreman, you might be interested in knowing that your ward is down by 3,171. What is the deal here? What are you all trying to do? I don't think this was done unbiased. I think it was a plan deal. I think there was gerrymandering involved. And I gave you that definition last month. And I'm sorry that I feel like nothing that I say is even heard from you all, especially Bria Clark. You're looking down at your papers. You never look up when someone talks. You just blow it off. That pisses me off. Please I watch your language, a... ma'am. Excuse Please me? Please watch your language, ma'am. Please what? Watch your language. Oh, thank you. Okay. I will. Thank you. But you know what? You have been governing this city without any, any consideration of most people. You're trying to just represent a few, and I'm not okay with it. It's like, what are you doing? Anyway, I am obviously not against this. I think it needs to be redone. I think the committee needs to be reappointed with maybe some uh, unbiased people that really want Norman to succeed and be successful. And I don't think you've, I don't think you've chosen the right people. And that's just my opinion. And Kelly, just to you personally, you have. 2,100 more people to help you get reelected. And I hope you can do it because you know that we are not going to support you. Thank you. You're uh, Jonathan Kendall. Uh, good evening, Norman City Council. Uh, my name is Jonathan Kendall, and I'm a current Ward 5 resident. I was blessed with the opportunity to move to Norman with my family, with my most set of uh, recent set of naval orders. Norman was my first choice. This was the first opportunity since I enlisted in 2001 to obtain a residence that felt like a home, rather than just a temporary arrangement. My wife and I both grew up around livestock, and we were fortunate enough to find a home with land to share that same experience with our children. My oldest daughter is the current FFA president and 4-H vice president. My two 
but they're also involved with FFA and 4-H. The opportunity has helped teach them many life lessons, such as hard work, discipline, responsibility, caring for another life, and so much more. Despite the additional work, they see tangible reward in showing their sheep, goats, rabbits, etc. I say this all to highlight the often overlooked gem of Norman, the agricultural community, which is absolutely a unique community characteristic aspect. Our city has an amazing diversity, that's all. With that said, if you speak to many Ward 5 residents, there is a pervasive feeling of being overlooked, undervalued, or our opinions just don't matter. This feeling has existed since I moved into the ward, and I understand that it existed long before my arrival. It was highlighted in the stormwater discussions to where Ward 5 residents had to be loud in order to be heard, and once again came up to the forefront with the most recent reapportionment discussion. There have been a number of issues in recent time that have dis diminished the trust constituents have in this municipal body. In recent council member elections, we heard words such as renewed trust and transparency promised to constituents. Stormwater, senior center, recall, Norman Police Department budget, COVID relief fund budget, et cetera, have all served as, should have served as flags. That honesty, transparency, and the renewed confidence in this government body should have been a priority to every individual sitting upon the dais. This includes committees, committees whose recommendations affect all constituents. If these bodies are not open and transparent, you will not receive the trust you claim you desire. Most of us have heard the recordings from the reapportionment meetings. It will be difficult to challenge, it will be a difficult challenge to convince me and many here that there wasn't political motivation involved in what's supposed to be a nonpartisan body. More specifically, the intentions of any council member should not be taken into account in the process of redistricting Norman's wards. Further, I have not committed over 20 years in serving this amazing country, protecting your rights, and upholding the U.S. Constitution for a member of that same committee to make a generalized statement about myself and my neighbors. There are racist and backwards people all over this community, every ward, every neighborhood. I've seen it in the military and strongly push against it, but it's a disservice to do so for Ward 5. If this body truly desires trust and your actions should follow, this looks like making every effort to fulfill your duties in an honest and transparent manner, including committees. Those who would err to make it in a political process or racially motivated should be respectfully stepped down. Lastly, if you truly want to desire and trust, a new committee be formed or a variance to make it to where this council votes are revised to restart the process to ensure per the charter, borders are equalized and reflect common interests. Thank you. And it has been pointed out to me that though I didn't say it, comments should be directed to council as a whole and not directed to individual council members or myself. Okay. Um, Mark Wagner. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Mark Wagner from Ward 5. Uh, this entire reapportionment process should have been, could have been, and should have been very simple. Currently, only Ward 6 and 7 are outside the parameters of the committee as far as the plus or minus 5%. These two wards adjoin wards one, two, and four, which are low in their population and could easily handle the overages uh, that remain with, and still remain within the parameters. Uh, this action would bring the population of all of the wards closer to the mean instead of farther away from it. The first concern regarding the proposed uh, reimportionment in the wards uh, in Norman are the parameters. Plus or, five, plus or minus 5% or 10% variance is huge. You're talking about 1,600 people. And in our elections, that can be a, a big thing. I still don't know where you get the 27% deviation because the largest uh, was only about 18,000. So that's only about uh, 7 or 8%. Oh, well, I think 14 is what you said. Uh, even with those excessively wide parameters, the committee violated their own instruction. The proposed population difference between the most and the least populous wards would be in excess of 10%. The largest of the proposed wards, Ward 3, gains and loses to the same ward. Why is that necessarily? Uh, that from Ward 8. Similarly, Ward 7 both gains and loses to Ward 8 as well. If the goal is to equalize the population between these, this should be a necessary movement, which is at best confusing and leads to questions about why it's necessary. Again, it's, be, it's made way more complicated than it should be. This creates suspicion regarding the intent of the committee. A case could possibly be made that the excessive, complicated moves are proposed in order to disguise one narrow definition of gerrymandering by trying to keep the ward boundaries more or less straight. 
Also puzzling is the largest percent deviation specifically in Ward 5, making it the least populous ward in the city. Due the, to the nature of Ward 5 as the watershed for Norman and it being almost entirely rural, it makes no sense to slice off 11 square miles when the ward is already within the 5% variance as desired by the committee. The rural nature of the ward and agricultural zoning would tend to keep the population of Ward 5 very stable compared to the rest of the city. It's hard to justify removing 1,294 rural residents and place them in an urbanized area when the ward was already within the desired population range. Comments from the committee regarding the rapid future growth for Ward 5 indicate the committee is not realigning current population as they're, as they're uh, uh, told to do as much as trying to account for their un unannounced plans for development in Ward 5. Thank you. Um, Alex Torby. <coughs> Alex Torby, Ward 6. <clears throat> The recommendations from the reapportionment committee must be withdrawn and a new unbiased committee established. I believe this committee went into the first two meetings with a predetermined outcome as evident by the remarks that were captured on audio recording, which are a call to approve the ward boundary changes at the beginning of the meeting, racist remarks by Ms. Turner about the residents in Ward 5 and their council representative, Stormwater would finally pass if Ward 5 is broken up. <clears throat> the 11 square miles added to Ward 6 could be developed. None of these comments have anything to do with balancing resident population evenly between all the wards. It would make a lot more sense to add the rural portions of Ward 6 into Ward 5 because they would have common interest. Ward 5 is... <clears throat> Ward 5 is one of the things that makes Norman unique and special. The most egregious of all of this is that the city charter was not strictly followed. I would hope council would not approve the recommendations from this committee. Thank you. Thank you. That is all that signed up ahead of time. However, since we did not have these posted online for online sign up, if anyone else would like to speak, you will also have an opportunity to share three minutes with us. Seeing none, I need a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Thank you. The motion on the floor is to close the public hearing. Council members, you may cast your votes. All votes have been cast, now closed. Thank you. Item two is discussion and consideration of adoption of a resolution retaining or adjusting current ward boundaries in accordance with criteria in the charter and as set forth in US Supreme Court and Oklahoma Supreme Court jurisprudence. Before I ask for a motion, I'd like to recognize Catherine Walker to outline for council what we are required to do this evening under the charter language and state statute. Ms. Walker will walk them through three options. Thank you. Um, so under the charter, our options tonight are uh, to adopt a resolution retaining the current board boundaries. As we stated in the staff memo and earlier today, that's not recommended because of the population deviation between the wards based on the 2020 census. Uh, adopt a resolution uh, essentially adopting the, re the reapportionment ad hoc committee's recommendation or adopt a resolution adjusting the boundaries as you all see fit using the same criteria that we went through earlier, uh, same criteria that uh, is used uh, by the reapportionment committee. Again, population equality being uh, the prime consideration. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilmember Tortorello for a motion. Um, I make a motion to adopt the resolution amending the boundaries recommended by the reapportionment ad hoc committee. Second. 
Council members, the motion on the floor is to amend the boundaries recommended by the reapportionment ad hoc committee. And I'd like to recognize Councilmember Tortorello again. Um, this question is directed to uh, Mrs. Green. There are several choices that uh, were presented. Can we start with the recommendations made by Mrs. Zorba uh, from the last meeting and go from there? Mr. Zorba recommended that we move some area south of Highway 9 into Ward 1. Come on. And then to equalize things, I believe he was suggesting I need this to move. this section of Ward 1 into Ward 6. And because it was cut off, this section of Ward 1 would have to be moved into Ward 5. So the thing to do now is look at the... the what? Um, this piece over here, oh yeah, that is what I'm trying to do. Thank you. I thought I had it on there. Oh, sorry folks. Oops, missed a little piece. Okay. So since Ward 1 is okay, from there you would basically incrementally and he didn't really get this far in his suggestion, but you'd incrementally move things between Ward 5 and Ward 6 to get those within deviation. Hold on. Let me move this. Yes. So I think you would start doing that by moving the areas that were moved from Ward five in toward six back in toward five. Which I'm not entirely sure where I started. Take a little no, bit more back in. Part here. It comes out of Lindsay going over to uh, <coughs> right there, 36. It's right. Pretty close. Uh, no, 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 no. She, she needs to put it back. Do I lose the north part of six there? It should go back to Ward six. Just, if you can go back to the boundaries that were <laughs> the current boundaries for Ward five and Ward six on 36th Street. Um, on this area? Yeah, so, yeah. so what, I, what I was asking was, Mr. Zorber was suggesting as a possibility to, to move, you're looking at his, his, what he asked for, 
but we need to move back into Ward 5, what was put in Ward 6, but also you cut off the north portion of Ward 6, all the way to Franklin. Exactly. That should go back to Ward 6. Yeah. So from like Tunkada. All the way um, to Indian Hill. Yeah. From what is that, 12 to 36? Right. Look at your numbers at the bottom. Yeah, look at the numbers at the bottom. We need to get the total deviation amongst the ward at least to where it will round to 10%. Okay. Let's do a quick review of this and just check it. No. So this is going to, it's like, and right now it's failing the overall range test because it is, when you add 4.93 to 5.87, you're going to get a deviation greater than 10%. Right. What happens if we put back that part of Ward 6 that was put in Ward 5 at the very top back to Ward 6? How would that look with the new numbers? That will make it worse, but we can look at it. I don't know how. <laughs> but okay. Let me see. Yeah, why is it not doing that? I think they want Let's to try it again. Let's go out. Back. Set on Ward 6. Okay, there it took it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's do the review of it again and check integrity. And it's failing the overall range check. And it's always going to fail the connectivity check because there's an island in Ward 4 but because of the university. But so your overall range is over 11% in this case. What if you get back? What if you took back the southern part of Ward 6, that blue part next to 5 and? It's a, it's one. the, uh, yeah, so it's off, it's in war, it's in one. Right now. Uh, Lindsay and 36 and 48th Street back to it's Ward 6. Is it 24th and there's 6? Which one? Right, right there. Moving it back to You want this one to no. go back <laughs> to <laughs> Ward 5? Where yeah, do you want that's Ward 5. What would that be? Okay. That's. Okay, so that makes Ward 6 12% under and Ward 5 6.99% over, which is... That was in Ward 1. Yeah, that was Ward 1. So what, can we scroll up to see or zoom out? We're a little in. Let me get rid of this connectivity. I can't see what it needs to do. That should be... Porter. What if I got back precinct 55 area? The okay. just west of Porter, north of Rock Creek. Right here. Okay. Spot. Back to Ward Six. This one may be weird. Was it? Make sure I have data. So when people. Okay. Because I'm like, 
So Ward 6 is down 7.30, and Ward 8 is down 7.44. So you will still fail the um, integrity check because the overall deviation range is going to be too great. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? You, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get back. Ward. You didn't get back. Yeah, and then the seat just changed. Mm -hmm. That last one that had a bunch of residents in it from Ward 6 to Ward 5 that was previously Ward 1 just has too many people in it. You have too many people now in Ward 5. I know. Can we yeah. put that back in Ward 1? Just saying. <laughs> that square for 36 to 48 between Lindsay and Alameda. Can we? What's up? Can you cut it in half? So, yeah. you want to, uh, Council Member um, Dudley, are you asking to put that back in Ward 1 and see what the numbers would be? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. And then that's going to give her too many people. But she can give some, she give some to you. Okay, would worth that and this, the population that was added to five, from give, five below there, it would be Give too that big. little sliver back to seven then. Yeah, but. Oh, that would make them. The one off high. class then? Oh. Yeah, that's 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to have that. It would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's going to look strange, but if it, it could go into Ward 4. <coughs> yeah. Um, Catherine, I had a question. Sure. So part of the issue here is that some of the wards, as they exist, are completely developed out, right? right? Mm -hmm. And some of the wards have already significant a significant number of plats that have been approved, specifically southeast area of Highway 77, which would be the southwest corner of Ward 5. So Walmart mm -hmm. and the links. There's a massive development that was approved seven years, six, seven years ago by this council uh, called Destin Landing, which is five, six square miles. And it's a 30 year development that was approved by the council six years ago. I voted against it, but it passed five to four. So does the, do these maps have to anticipate how much deviation may may take place over the next 10 years of population growth? We certainly tried to. Uh, the committee was provided uh, maps that showed plats that had been approved because you want these numbers ideally to be good for 10 years until the next census. And so you don't want uh, the wards to get so far apart in the next 10 years that you have to do this again and then change it again in 2030. Um, so they did look at that and that was considered and that is really why I think the committee started where it did. It started sort of in core Norman where it was already built out because you knew those numbers weren't going to get a lot bigger and then moved kind of around clockwise from there. Um, but that is something they considered. That's one of the points that I was initially confused about until uh, Councilmember Schuler and I discussed it um, was that, you know, for my ward, I'm losing two, over 2,000 people. I'm not gaining. I'm the only ward not gaining any space at all. I'm gaining no people. Um, and that's in large part in my understanding because Ward 7, I have a lot of houses under development. I've had several large apartment complexes built in my ward, potentially more uh, coming in the, near, in the future. Uh, there's one apartment complex that we've approved in Ward 7 that hasn't been built yet on South Highway 77 near Post Oak. And so that led me to understand that part of this equation was how much it, it, each ward might have potential to grow over the next 10 years. And some of them, based on plats that have already been approved uh, and based on where they are in proximity to the urban area, have a lot of potential to grow over the next 10 years, whereas others don't have really any potential to grow. Is that? Absolutely. And, and you still have to stay within that 10% deviation based on current numbers. 
but that might be a reason why you would keep uh, a growing ward a little on the low end in the, of that deviation, knowing that in the next 10 years they're likely to grow. Um, and so just trying to keep them within that 10% mm -hmm. now and for the next 10 years, uh, but using current numbers only to, to really compare. But Dustin's Landing, Dustin Landing could potentially add several thousand new residents to Ward 5 over the next decade or two, depending on how quickly that. Depending on how quickly and how they phase it. Right. Yeah. Whereas Ward 2 and Ward 3, Ward 2 is completely developed out. It's landlocked and has the river on the south side. Ward 3 is completely developed out and has the floodplain and the river on the west. Um, and Ward 4 is completely developed out, uh, with the exception that we are starting to see high, higher density, taller buildings, things like that, which are kind of an X factor for growth in Ward 4, because, you know, if the center, center city plan works out the way we hope it does over the next 15 years, Ward 4 might see some uh, potential uh, population growth as well. Um, yeah, and those aren't necessarily coming as plats, so right, those are just any time flat activity. And so part of it, too, uh, I know a lot of discussion has been made about the, the 12, is it 11. 11 square miles of Ward 5 that would be added to Ward 6. But from my understanding of current development policy, uh, referring to the one house per 10 acre rule, only four square miles of this potential would be able to be developed uh, because 48th Avenue is the cutoff on the on the East cannot build one more than one house per 10 acre east of 48th. You also cannot build more than one house per 10 acre north of Franklin Road. So on this map, there's actually only four, I say only, I would love for this, uh, all of that to stay rural, but uh, there are four square miles identified out of the 11 under our current policies that would allow for some sort of urbanized development, but the rest would remain rural under our existing development policies, am I correct about that? Correct, yeah, and we talked about that. I think there was fear among some that if you have, if you're moved into an urban ward and you have representation rec that is focused on urban interests, that that policy could change. Mm. I got a question. Uh, That's all just I for clarification, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine, yeah, I'm done. Clarification on Destin Landing here. So um, you said it was approved by council six years ago. Um, have all the plats been developed? And Destin Lennon, Ms. Walker? No, no, no none no, of the no. plats have been developed yet. I do believe they're working on the first piece of that mm -hmm. coming in the next few months. You know, when here's my issue, and the, and the issue that Ward 5 looks at, when they're looking at potential future growth, um, you know, we just saw a couple of weeks ago with uh, Eagle Cliff where, you know, that growth was stunted and, um, and, and not approved. So we don't know what the councilors are going to do going next year, next year after this. So that's the issue is that if we if we project based on future growth, and this process, you know, quite frankly, should have taken a longer process over time, looking at the numbers, back and readjusting. Um, but with only three or four meetings, um, in the last meeting, um, when they were asked, you know, they, they kind of rushed into it uh, for a vote. My only concern going forward is that you know, it's hard to plan on future growth because things change. Things can be voted out and, you know, we would love to keep growth, but uh, as we've seen so far, um, they can vote growth down. Um, I don't know what we can do tonight to go forward. Um, you know, talking to previous members of the last reapportionment committee, they would take slivers and slivers and, and meet more than three or four times to look at the map and have public input and you know make it transparent so we don't have to be in a position where we're at today and we have to question the committee's motives here. That should never have come to this point. Um, I don't know, like I said, there's, there's a lot of boundaries we can move tonight, but do we have all night to do this is the question, all right? Um, to make it fair for everyone. But I don't think future growth should be the main criteria and we should keep like areas together. And I understand the concept that if rural areas move into an urban area where they still receive you know, representation, that's debatable. It's, um, you know, I'm not gonna question the motives of my council members here, but that's not what people want. They want a transparency going forward. 
every meeting and every move they made. And I think there's there's a lot more room we can, we can use to, to maneuver and get these numbers where we need to to meet the parameters as outlined by the charter and the instructions um, to make everyone happy. Um, like I said, I don't know how much time we have tonight on, on this, um, but making the changes here, <coughs> like moving Ward 6 and Ward 1 down south, um, we made the changes and um, Mr. Zorba had some some proposals here and Mrs. Goodchild had some proposals too as well they weren't listened to and I just think we're in a precarious situation where we rush this tonight um, what happens you know next year and, and the next 10 years could impact the wards going forward Ward 5 has been asking for representation and we have been ignored by the members who've lived there and all they're asking for is that the shot and and the process is fair and transparent and not rushed um, so that's just what I got to say right now. Um, any other suggestions, Ms. Green, that was proposed during this process of the meetings? No, I think we did the one. I mean, and you were just you the one. That's the only one that I remember that was not actually necessarily done to its full, you know, full fruition. And to make that one work, you would have to take more of Ward Six back into five. So. So you will have to. I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I was going to say you can make. I mean, there were the there were no others. There were many suggestions, and much like you found out tonight, many of them did not work. So they went down probably five, ten, fifteen, even different paths. Many of which did not work. I know at one point we had a great deal of Ward Five and Ward Seven, but that did not work. Um, so there were many paths that were gone down, but as you see, it's hard to make the numbers balance. No, I understand, and I appreciate the work you've done. It's just that, um, you know, after four meetings, actually they made the decision at the second meeting, and uh, that's, that's what was, you know, seen and listened to. Um, I'm just saying tonight, I don't, I don't think we have the time to do it tonight to make it fair and transparent. It's, the question is, talking to the previous members of the reapportionment committee from 2010 to 2015, they explained every move and they published every move uh, and why they did it. Um, I just feel that Ward 5 members didn't see that. Um, even the Ward 5 representative, Mrs. Goodchild, claimed many times that she asked to do and look at something different and she was denied. Um, you know, so um, that is an issue when it comes to equal representation of the law and under the census numbers here that we look at the census numbers here and do the best we can. If it takes, you know, six or seven meetings to do this, and it's for transparency's sake. Um, I don't think we have the time to, to look at this thoroughly tonight, and that's the issue because we have to make a decision. Um, I don't want to keep everyone here all night either because that's not my, my issue either. But again, if, if, if the committee had followed the recommendations, at least talked to the old reapportionment committee members for best practices, um, they could have given them some pointers. And as far as I know, uh, his hearsay that they never asked, they were never asked to, to come back and help with this new reapportionment uh, with the new census numbers here. So um, that's an issue with me and Ward 5, and um, that's where I stand right now. Thank you. Councilmember Foreman. So I think it's really unfortunate that we're in this position that we're in, and this has become a very um, contentious topic. Um, I did want to note that we were asked to give a recommendation from each ward, all the council members, and my appointee was Mike Zorba, and he's here tonight. And on the last vote, when they were voting to recommend, he voted against because they did not um, further look into more boundary changes, and I'm really glad he voted that way because I would have refused um, to vote for it as well for those very reasons. Um, a lot of the things that I was going to ask Ms. Hudson, we've kind of already touched on about um, Councilmember Holman talking about 48th is the line we can't develop. So whether it's in five or six, we can still develop that um, regardless, and that would be dependent on the property owner if they wanted to do that. But it's only 730, and I'd really like to give this a go. So could we readjust the lines some more? What if six went out to 48th in one or two play? I mean, I don't, I don't know how this is going to work one is off could i consume more of ward eight because i am a council member who does make decisions heavily based on the public opinion and when there's large protests i usually listen to that 
I've done that with my ward, and I'm willing to do that with potential future constituents and even the residents of Ward 5. So however we can make this work that makes the numbers work and the residents happy, we need to find that sweet spot. What if we go around, because it seems like whenever I was watching those reappointment committees, it seems like you guys were trying to go counterclockwise. So what if instead of doing that, we start going clockwise? So we look at seven and take that from mine, that little sliver, give it back to seven, and then just kind of go around that way to try to even them out clockwise. Does that make sense? Whatever we have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with you. looking at anything. I'm down to looking, looking at it as well. I think that it's important that if our, if our constituents want to look at this that we do look at this and right. give it a good effort um, I'm with you it's only 7 30 we've been here late into the night listening to all kinds of stuff so I think that this shouldn't bother us too much to stay a little bit later and work on this Usually this is like noon for, time take a break first and then go yeah. but I, I'm agreeing I, I agree with you uh, councilwoman for ward one um, if, if you guys want to stay and look at the numbers again um, we'll, we'll stay as long as we we well, are motions to amend and so that's where we're at so we're not at postponing it but i would really like to push through and try to get this together the opinions of the public are not going to change this is your feelings and so we need to do the best that we can to make this work i agree on that that was actually in ward seven that you're putting in ward four right now that's in seven. No, she's moving this that was moved to here into Ward 4. I mean, that is in Ward 4. Oh, I see. And if we're doing a sticking to straight lines, then stick to the straight line. Yeah, but we can't because of we're, we're already under. Right, but we're going to be moving this way. Okay. We're going to touch every ward to try to adjust yeah, it. I don't so the issue I've had with the triangle here in Ward 7 is that over the last four census uh, and reapportionment processes, this little triangle here bound between Classen, 12th, and Lindsay has actually switched back and forth between right. Ward 1 and Ward 7 every 10 years. Yep. And so, you know, Honestly, I've had no zero Ward 7 residents have contacted me or reached out to me about this process, um, except for the person that I pointed to the committee. And I would just reiterate the person on this committee representing Ward 7 is someone I appointed. Uh, you know, the mayor is the mayor and has the power to do what they do. But we all made, I mean, I say all of us that were on council at the beginning of the year made recommendations for appointments. Uh, and I, the one that I chose was the one appointed uh, for my ward. Uh, but I have expressed to him and others uh, that my only real concern about the changes to Ward 7 was that that triangle keeps getting volleyed back and forth every 10 years. And mm -hmm. it would be nice to give those folks some sort of stability in the ward that they live in. Uh, but at the same time, when I look at this, uh, making that change to put Ward 7 at 7.2% uh, or 72 which doesn't give much room for any of the other wards to balance it out if I, if I get that yeah. section back as much as I'd like to. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're gonna, this, I guess this goes back. Is that what you all want to do? Is just, just go around? I mean, the going the other way didn't work. So first of all, just point of clarification, um, I know that we're talking about anticipated growth and what's already been platted and that we have considered that at the commission level. But I think what I heard Ms. Walker say is that this is all based on current numbers. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, whether or not you want them on, on the plus side of the deviation or the negative side, right. but it still has to be within 10% between largest and smallest. And all of these numbers you're seeing and you're comparing are actual current population numbers based on the 2020 census, not on plats. So this is current real time numbers. Yes. And the deviation that we're supposed to stay within for what we're considering right now. Right. So just 
a couple of comments. Um, again, I want to say publicly that we were all invited to nominate a person from our ward to represent our ward. And I think we all in good faith nominated someone who we felt could come to the table and be neutral and consider the parameters that they were um, instructed to work under with the primary one, again, point of clarification, equalizing population. Correct. That's the number one goal. Yes. And then everything else is a subset under that. Right. Okay. So um, I want to just reiterate that all of the work that we do as a council, as a board, as a commission, these are public meetings. They are noticed. Everyone knows that these meetings are happening. They have an agenda. And, you know, I can't really sit and judge about how many meetings it would take to get it right. But apparently the majority of the commission felt like they had taken um, the um, opportunity to use the software as manipulated by Ms. Green to explore multiple options. So again, you know, we <laughs> made the conscious decision according to our charter and state statute to turn this over to what I think we all thought we were doing was an impartial neutral commission and with the goal of not necessarily putting it back in the hands of the city council. So just saying, that's where we are right now. And yes, we do hear you and we are listening to you. And I am prepared to stay here as long as it takes tonight to manipulate these maps because you took the time and the energy to come here. So you are the most invested in the outcome. And I don't see any reason to not try for at least the next hour or so to move this around and maybe it will help enlighten everyone as to what the difficulty is and why there was some, you know, dissent on the committee to getting it right. So, you know, we have Mr. Zorba here who represents Ward 6. We have Ms. Goodchild, I think she's still here. Are you still here? Left. Oh, she left. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take all that into consideration and we're here, we're all present. We have the expert right here that can, um, you know, use the software so you can see it in real time for yourself and perhaps we can get somewhere. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is interesting just on what I'm hearing, the feedback that I'm hearing from those that are here tonight and those that I've heard from, and again, I've heard from no one in Ward 4, so they're happy with the outcome, I'm assuming. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting that there's a suggestion to put it back into a commission that I'm also hearing you don't have confidence in. So is that even an option to take it back to the commission or is it really in our hands now? It's in your hands now. Um, the, the language in the charter now, as I said, is new. Previously, we had a standing committee uh, that met once a year to look at development data and during the charter, or I'm sorry, during the census, when the data came out, they'd start meeting about that. And, and they really controlled what got presented to council and council's options were to either accept it or not. Uh, this is the first time that you all have had this option to, to change the boundaries. And what we're finding is the timeline in the charter is pretty compressed for this exercise. Mm -hmm. um, you get 30 days from the date the reapportionment committee uh, makes their recommendation um, to come up with some solution, whether that's <coughs> adopt their resolution or their recommendation or to come up with your own. Uh, and so we do need to do that uh, within that 30 day time, fr time frame. It will still come forward to you all as an ordinance and under state law it will require two thirds majority vote to be successful. Okay. So it's important that, that tonight we get <clears throat> some consensus. Well, in my mind, um, this is the purpose of a public hearing. We're hearing from the public and um, now we have an amendment, uh, we have a motion on the floor to amend it, and here we are, and here's Ms. Green, and I think we invest some time and see if we can make any progress and see how easy or how hard it is. Um, the other thing I was, just another point of clarification, um, 
Ms. Green manages all of our GIS information for the city of Norman. Um, you look at this kind of data and these kind of maps all day, every day. So if there's anything that you see that seems obvious to move around, I would welcome your input. Council Member Schuler. Um, yes. So I have a couple of points that I want to make before we move um, <coughs> forward with uh, this process. Some of them echo um, what Council Member Hall just stated. Um, I think what we're seeing here tonight is um, a new, slightly new process with Council being able to um, manipulate the, the boundaries after our committee or our commission has uh, given us a, a map. Um, and so I think that, one, I think that it's really important when we think about looking at reapportionment and how we're drawing maps and boundaries that the process is transparent because we have public hearings, because our, our committees are open to the public, because our council members asked were asked and were given recommendations to the mayor to appoint members from their ward. Um, I think that some of the rub is that with transparency comes um, some misunderstanding, some clarification that needs to be um, processed and understood. And I think maybe that's where we miss the mark um, is really explaining what this process was going to look like and should look like from the beginning. Um, so I have confidence that the committee did look at a lot of different things. Um, but what we are also hearing from the public is that you don't feel heard, that you have, um, expressed, um, specifically certain wards do not feel like their interests are being represented or heard or that they may be diluted in the process because of uh, these new maps. And I think that um, I'm, a, I'm slightly concerned about this now being in the hands of council and I want to make sure that the members of council really, that we stay focused on the task at hand, that we really think about the numbers and it really just be about population and keeping our maps contiguous um, and that it does not deviate in any way, shape or form into anything else. Any other parameters outside of what does the population look like? Are we keeping um, interests together like our agricultural community, our rural residents, right? And making sure that they feel um, that they have been heard through this process. I think that, um, we're in a unique situation. Um, while I, I don't think that council should necessarily be the ones that are manipulating the final maps, um, here we are because of this condensed timeline, because of the pandemic, because of getting the census numbers back um, so late from the Census Bureau. Um, and I think that to do our due diligence to make sure that our residents feel heard and that we look at every possibility to make sure um, that these maps are right for the next 10 years for our community, um, that we give you our time because that's what we signed up for. We signed up to, to listen, to, to talk through this. Um, and if ultimately, you know, the same map is what we end up on, that's what we did our due diligence to make sure that we got to that. With, with all of the different mapping, with all of the different move this here, move that, to this ward um, to make sure that people feel represented and heard. Um, so I hope that through this process, um, we can figure that out, but let's stay on task with numbers <laughs> and boundaries. Um, and I would request a break before we um, jump into all of that, because I think we may be here a little bit. So with that. We have several more comments. Uh, after the comments, before we start. Councilmember Studley. And I just wanted to ask if once we start this, instead of starting from this map that was already moved around, can we start with our current wards, how they are, and let us kind of manipulate it from how it is right now versus trying to manipulate this new one? Yeah. <coughs> okay. I think that would be easier for all of us to start with. Yeah. All right.
right, I think that was our last comment. So let's take a five minute break.
I mean, like to the old map before they make changes. I think they think that he can still pick and slip it off and say he can start it and get it to balance without having to start all over. <laughs> all right. We're going to go ahead and resume, and I believe that there has been a request to not start completely over. So we will go back to what the committee or the commission has recommended. I think the comments that were received during break were that if a lot of the other wards are not that far off a of deviation, so maybe if you can just take slivers of the ones that are really far, you won't have to start all over, and you can get there faster. both have over 18,000 and they're connected to some of the wards that are under 15,000 so why not just move from there I think that's what she's gonna do on the original map though can we vote I mean we are a council can we decide of how we would like to do this sure So then what was the point of having a committee at all yeah. if we're going to start completely over? Well, that's the point of being a council is that we don't have to take their recommendation. We can do whatever we kind of want. With it. And well, if we, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. If we thought it was political before, it's certainly going to be political now. Let's start over. Please give us the beginning map, and we'll start with these suggestions. And um, I just want to state that the Wait till I get your mic on before you talk because nobody at home can hear anything you're saying. Mm. <clears throat> okay, Joyce, take it away. <laughs> okay, <laughs> somebody make the initial suggestion of what they want to move. But, but if we're just, just looking at numbers, if we're looking at Ward 7 and Ward 6, which both have over 18, and then the lowest wards are 4, and two, how do those connect to six and seven? Well, two, you so four and two being the lowest and six and seven being the highest. So two has a boundary with ward two down here along the river basically in highway nine. And four has a boundary with six up here. So how do you, how do you guys want to do that? Two and Six. three are the same. Changing, uh, doing that's going to drastically alter the character of Ward 7 or Ward 4. Yep. If you add a section of Ward 6, which is very suburban, to the old older urban Ward 4, that's a change in character. If you remove the whole university from Ward 7 and add a large part of suburban Ward 5, that's a massive change in character to my ward. So I don't see how you could lop off the top of my ward and add more of it to the south uh, to either Ward 5 or Ward 2 without significantly altering the character of Ward 7. If you look, well, no, because that's rural land too. And the part of Ward 7 that borders Ward 2, there's actually nobody that lives in that part of Ward 7. Yeah. That's the wastewater treatment plant and Lloyd Noble Center. That's what I was just looking at. So, Ms. Walker, to clarify, the maintaining communities of interest is something we should shoot for, but population equality is our number one priority. Yes, if you can't reach population equality exactly, it should be because of a com community of common interest, those things, but population equality is number one. Um, and 
those other considerations come into play as you decide your deviations within 10%. You cannot go over that 10%. Thank you. Right, but we're going to go ahead and go to the do you have in terms of suggestions? We have a suggestion. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> okay, so on the original map, mm -hmm. if you were to take 36 to 60th, north of Franklin to Indian Hills, and give that to me, Ward 6. So we're wanting to add, we need to take away from Ward 6. Yes, oh. because you're, you're over, you're, yeah, so you're going the wrong. Oh, so 24 to 36, give that to 5. North. Okay, so you're Frank. talking 24th to 36, north of Franklin to 5? Yeah, so those two upper right, Nope. That is that's the old map. So there's <coughs> that's rural. Is that where you're at? Not there. We're rural. All right, what does that do for us? Let's just say come on, board is not. Just looking at truly population. I don't give a shit about. I come on. I'm on board five. Because there's no way. Like, this is hard for me to look at because it's not what we currently have. Okay, there we go. So let's see, ward six. That didn't really do much to ward six. Yeah, you're way out of. Gave up to four or eight. Who can I consider that? Which part? Let's see, I like the MIT. Like here? <laughs> like south of Robinson. Ms. Green, can you, ex can you go back or zoom out just a bit? Yeah. All your mics are hot, by the way. <laughs> so everything you're saying is going out live. That, that's the only way I can capture your, your comments because you're talking without your mic gotcha. on. <clears throat> so, we'll, which part do you want to move into Ward 4? Okay, I got to see this. <laughs> Up here. So, Robinson between East 24th and 12th down to Alameda. Yeah, right there. Okay. What if I gave that up to 4? Not that I want to lose you, Ward 6. Should bring you down, but not up, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. We're gonna put GIS on the whole thing. Yes, um. <laughs> okay. See? Okay. Not bad. You're getting some work to do else. Huh. Here we got six. Mm. Okay, and then hold on, I missed a couple. Do we go back to the proposal for seven? Two and three and eight, or do we take issue with that? Put Kelly down. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah. What about that little gap that's in between two and seven? That's part of four. Can you give that to two to increase two's population now? Where's what? which which street? Uh, in between seven mm -hmm. and two, there's that street. There's that piece. It's that block that goes down to Ward 4, it's what if you gave that to Ward 2? Pickard and Barry. Okay. Okay. You're talking about this the piece here? Yes. The top one there. <coughs> but <coughs> that's a technical help.
Alright, so. There's the seven. There you go. Four, five, six. So we gotta give some seven a one. Husband, home. What do you look? So, do you have any input on just what sliver you want to move around from seven to one, just to kind of equalize? No. So, take that little triangle area and move it into ward one. Deviation. So now we gotta do three. But one still needs to be maybe. Right. No. Oh, no. Where's where's <laughs> Councilman Lynn? I don't know. I think he ran to the restroom. Oh, okay. <gasps> Mario has a perfect cup. So all right. Do we take that? What is that? One is a little bit high, but. Where's that southern part of word three? And and now you need. Oh, we need to go <coughs> Raise the map up. Go, go north on the screen. Or up. The river. <laughs> so is the goal to. <coughs> I, I'm going to wait. But well, we're doing a good job. Where we're at to, to kind of equalize the population. I mean, right now it's it's we're doing a phenomenal job. I like to have uh, Councilman Lynn's input on to Ward Three. So, are, is the goal to maintain the status quo in Ward Five? It, it, the God think the goal is to equalize the population. It, looking at a different view, mm -hmm. a different view, and that's what we're doing now. Is to, we started over with the original map, and we just made micro surgery moves. No, we have sure. not made microsurgery moves. Uh, the numbers look fine. Everything is starting to equalize. And this is just another option to look at. I'm willing to look at it. We're just looking at it right What's now. What's your issue, Council Member Hall? My issue is that I am comfortable taking the work, the three meetings of work that the commission did, and as you were suggesting, Council Member Tortorello, to do slivers here and there with the people who are protesting, which is Ward 5. I have not heard anything from Ward 4. Now we are talking about drastically changing what Ward 4 looks like, and we have no opportunity to have input. So if we're trying to address the people who have come to protest and what you're trying to accomplish, I think we should be starting with what was recommended to us and see if we can make incremental micro changes as you're suggesting instead of starting over. Well, I thought we all re wanted to start over. No. I thought no. was a consensus no. over that we wanted to start over. No. That was not a consensus. So, do, I mean, we started over and we're looking at the map and I'd like to see how far this goes on this iteration. Um, I understand your concerns. Um, I thought we all voted or at least had a consensus to start over with the original map. No. I think it was half and half. half we didn't. One and half well, it, Brand, Councilman, you know, Studley had requested we start over again. So, you know, I agree with her that it was half and half. And so let's just finish what we have now and, and compare it and then go from there. I understand your concerns. We could, we could do this and then take the one that the committee also did and kind of do some slivers from that and then look at the two together that's that's a plan so this I, I think very long and we're almost through here i think councilmember hall's point about our residents thought we were going to do something tonight and now it looks completely different than what we've been relying on this entire time and nobody has any notice are we able to do another public hearing after this 
This is where the charter timeline gets really compressed uh, with this new process. It gives you 30 days from the date of the committee's recommendation to adopt a resolution, either keeping the boundaries as is, adopting their recommendation, or changing them. There will be an opportunity for public notice and we'll have a public hearing when the ordinance comes forward on second reading. Um, and so there will be an opportunity for that, but that won't be until the date of the ordinance adoption. And what if for some reason with that public notice and that public hearing, it doesn't pass because it requires a two thirds vote. And now instead of one ward being upset, we have seven wards being upset. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't pass, we would, I would assume go back to the drawing board. There's not a, um, there's not a time frame okay. for the council adoption. It's just uh, of the ordinance. It's just this resolution. So okay. it's a little funky, uh, but we're just trying to work with the language with what we have. State law doesn't say a particular it timeline. It says a reasonable amount of time. Um, and you know, if you look across the state, that means different things in different cities. And so I think we're still being reasonable okay. uh, at that point. Well, that's, that's helpful, I think. It's not some drop dead deadline to have the process completed it's just we have a timeline for this specific recommendation right, for the resolution and the resolution is going to inform you know the ordinance that we draft whatever you guys adopt tonight that's how we'll work on the ordinance and Joyce has to put in the the legal you know boundaries of each ward into that ordinance so it's it's challenging to adopt an or amend on the floor so if you get to that point in January we would probably say postpone and let us draft and give you another opportunity to vote on does final. the resolution require two-thirds vote no it's just uh to adopt the boundaries but ideally you know we'd like two-thirds votes on the resolution so we know that what we're drafting for council's adoption ultimately is something that would pass oh councilman berlin has returned <laughs> we've been waiting on you yeah, actually, we have. <laughs> actually, yes. Uh, why don't we proceed with this, finish this iteration, and then continue this discussion? Okay, so what do you want to add to Ward 3? <laughs> she can't see her. Do you want, can you pull it back a little bit? I don't know if they can see her. what you have is more three is pretty big so it's hard to I think so. Yeah. You can try that little sliver. Precinct seventy six, which is what was added. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That yeah, little sliver right there. Can we just take it and put that back in there? This is how you end up adding the angle of the wall to make it all work. <laughs> okay. On that big so big again, that's mm -hmm. too much. So you have to start taking something out of three to make that work. How much is it too much? It is 6.7% And then where do you? Positive. So you need to leave, lose at least a percent and a half or so. And then can you go yeah, too small. So you can see where that came out of three. I know. That's three thousand short. And if you take away that part that is proposed, <coughs> even though I have had some pushback on that. So do you want me to move this back into eight? I mean, does that get it where it needs to be? Because that's what's proposed. Taking that. I think it should get it close. But yeah, it's, I thought it was only one hundred eighty-seven people. Something along yeah. those lines. I don't know. These softwares are always a little touchy. Don't get angry, will you? No, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. so that didn't do anything. <laughs> well, back three, 
Ward three is back where Sorry. it more or less started. However, Ward eight <laughs> is very negative. So we need to add to Ward eight. I mean, it is. No, we need Part of six or two or something. Yes. So when did they came into six? When I came into five? <coughs> what part do you want to get the board eight? Is that part? Right. No. Oh, yes. Five. Where do you Go want ahead. to move eight? And here's the conundrum. <laughs> and this is why yeah. they hit the wall. Um, Okay. Um, okay, where Ward 6 is on the north, what if to the west I gave that to 8, and then on the east I took from 5? Okay, so where on the Right ward? there. This? Really? Right th Did you, did you hear that? Huh. that the, this part here was given the eight, but we can give slivers and see what the number's like. Is he is under thirteen thousand, and moving this back might bring him up. Be more equal with everyone else. Okay, so now what are they to do? Good God! Give a little bit back. Taking five. <laughs> okay. That puts you under 11,000. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to take, take part of it back. I'm going to start with taking this eight. back to six. And then like we can like these two areas here mm -hmm. and see where the numbers go. This is where the concentration, which is giving him the extra yeah, numbers and taking from her. Steps. So what about we go back and give this to Ward 8 and keep this for now mm -hmm. and see what the numbers look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fine. That's, the only That's still one. negative. <laughs> and now I have both. That's fine. So Miss Green, let her, Miss Green know. Does she hear us? Uh, what about giving precinct fifty-five to eight? That's. Well, do you need to give? To, no, you're you're under now. Oh, I'm under now. You, well, you're at uh, fourteen thousand. Yeah. I know. Right. We might just need to go back so to the proposed map. Do we really think we're going to sit up here? And change and make a better decision than a committee that met multiple times and spent hours talking about this. Are we going to do this on the fly and make a better decision? Than this? Second that. Ooh, we're running around in circles here, literally. I think it's important to show the public, though, even when when we're trying, how difficult this is, and how hard they had to work to get the population to where it was as even as it was and not everyone is going to be happy as we can all tell even just with us as council um but i think it's important to at least try yeah. and show show and tell game yeah i am it's just not working <laughs> yes. All of these so softwares moved. have it's it's the quirkiness of software. I do feel like at this point we just need to go back to the proposed map and start there because we've tried going this way and it's getting real funky. Yeah. So maybe Joyce, okay. I appreciate all your clicking. <laughs> I really do. But all maybe right. so, okay. now that we've tried that, it's not going to work. So let's go back to the proposed map and start shaving little by little. Okay, 
And we're back at the beginning of the plan. What if I give Opposed. east to 48th back to Ward 5? What does that do? So that's 60th and then that little block is 72nd. Okay, say that one again. Um, east of 48th from Franklin down to Alameda and then over back to Ward 5. And I'd just like to stay if this is what we do, like Council Member Holman said earlier, whether 36 to 48th is in Ward 5 or Ward 6, that is still land that could be developed. East 48th is where not so much. Very specific. Okay, so that just still messes with me a little. Yeah, well, it is, you know, right now it's, um, you need to take some back, back from Ward. Let's see, what is which branch? Which squares? Me? Right here? Okay. What is that? Okay, what above Franklin, right there, those two squares up top? Mm -hmm. um, what is that? Right up here, Franklin and 60th, 60th and 72nd. No. Or maybe just one at first and then. Or maybe those those two. So, right here at the top, those two. Yeah. so you're wanting to take those back? Yeah. Okay. That didn't change much. <laughs> yeah. There's. Very the well. reason it is such a large area is because there are very mm. few people in it. What about the square below? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Okay. Mm. That's so annoying. The next square below? <laughs> I don't know, we're sorry, what do you think? Can you take them from eight? Could I take from eight? The reason I ask, because I, the streets that were south of Robinson, um, those are the only streets in Ward 8 that have been part of Ward 8 since the ward boundaries were created originally. So uh, from a historical perspe perspective, I'd love to see those put back in, and if that means having to give up um, what a precinct 55 is what that looks like, then... <laughs> so you want to put precinct 55 <clears throat> I know, to right? Six. Can you repeat that? Where Where do you want it? Uh, basically, give uh, precinct 55 to to six, which would be Porter to 12, uh, North yeah. Tecumseh, and then give back to eight um, the streets south of Robinson, which would be. Oh, I can't tell the street names on here. Yeah. Okay, so now you're low. So you want to take. You want to take back my southernmost. Well, he wants to take that other. The corner. southeast. Which, which piece? piece corner. Which piece back? No, yeah, right there where Westwood Golf Course is. Does it go? Is this proposed going to it? So you're wanting to take this piece here back? Yes. Exactly certain where we are. Well, actually, <laughs> let me go. 
go over here because I can't. Yeah, if you could make it a little Bravo. Salad. <laughs> Ooh, goodness, <laughs> salad. I think you wanted to get back to that. How did Matt, we get, how did we get back to that? Was. Matt wanted that to take this back into his it. ward because they were always, that was always in ward eight. Know. And then I mean, he I gave some of his to ward six. Back out. I know. So then what are we doing yeah, with two? Because I couldn't see. What did I do? Yeah, I put her wards on. So so well, it has to be five, right? It's under. Okay, so that one is, so Ward 2 is pretty much back to where it started. So what do you want to do with Ward 2? <laughs> what do I, <coughs> where can they? Are looking at me? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So what, if oh, <laughs> what if you take these houses that are right here that are on this side of the golf course. This is a whole precinct. It's already split in half. Oh. This is we really need a golf course, man. It is. And it's already split. I'm not kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're going to you're going to so five it's over 12. Four. We got to start seven and a positive five. So it's split in half right now. Right. I mean, we could take pieces of this out. Huh? Into two and see if we could get yeah. this in here. Can we get that recommendation there? Do we well, the four? precinct's already split. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, I think Straight they weren't taking away from four. They were just taking away from three. Yeah. I was going to say, they took away the... Yeah. Really? Yeah. Let me yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. What is yeah. that street okay. that runs straight across there? I can't see it, but it like it kind of cuts the southern end of that Westwood Golf Park off. Not there in the middle. Oh. I see what you're doing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to decide what what's what to go back over here. Be like these. That oh, all weird. dirty. <laughs> no, that's gerrymandering looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, yeah, let's put that back. <laughs> that's problematic. And then let me put this over here. We just like undo that. Okay. So. All right. So three is just a hair over. Let's see what it looks like. So, where are we at here? Let's do the review. I probably have missed some, so it's probably going to. Well, actually, it was all out pretty good. I can't see it. No, but it's there. We got check marks. Even the OG one. We got I don't know why. Wow. Can I see How do we feel yeah. about this? That's impressive. I don't, well, can like we take this. the box off? I mean, we got checked. So, and my frustration was based on starting over and trying to redo the whole thing. So, I just want to make that clear. <laughs> I just, you I had wanted the public to see exactly and I'm the whole thing. I, was, I don't think it was the right thing to do to completely redo the whole thing like that when we asked the committee if they were going to give them time. But I do agree with making adjustments to what they it's did. Hard to I think it's hard And it's more in line with what the charter says anyways for us to do anyway. So, I mean, the numbers do match. They do work. What you guys are all in agreement. Zoom in here. What the hell is going can, on can we zoom can in? Can we zoom into the center part? So we could see what that looks like. Yeah, are we which, serious? Which ward do you want to focus on? Because it's hard to. Can we look at the five and six really fast? No, that I was asking to see two. Oh. Well, thank you. You think what? So there is two. I mean, to get these. What does? I mean, does that really make sense? Because of how it was before, that was always part of board. Hmm. That's, what, that's what Matt was talking about, is this golf course. Well, it was always part of eight. 
and then that was also point eight. If it makes the numbers work, why wouldn't it make sense? Mrs. Which one? It should be hot. Yeah. We're, are we all hot? Yeah. Mrs. Walker, looking at the current numbers here and the deviations, I think are we within that the deviation numbers? Yes, the numbers are are definitely within 10 percent. They're improved, I think, uh, even from what they were before. I think the concerns are about the piece on Robinson just south. I mean. It is an odd line, but it's not uh, breaking up in yeah, the middle of a neighborhood street or something like that. That's something we watch out for. It is contiguous to the area north of Robinson. Um, so, you know, it's not a straight line, certainly, but historically no. it has not been. And the total deviation is 7.65, if I'm looking at the right one. Maybe we don't need to, but maybe the census can use the map as it really matter, but having the wards that have the least potential for any growth that already ran well be in the negative means that in 10 years those wards will be significantly out of alignment and will have to be drastically adjusted 10 years from now. So and, and it what can be slightly adjusted mm -hmm. now, but just r keep in mind that 10 years from now these wards may be have to be drastically adjusted because the uh, you know less the wards with the least likely growth potential on the lower end. And that is under the charter that's something that council could ask or appoint a reapportionment ad hoc committee to look at at any time with a unanimous vote. So if you do see some of these plats we know are, are out there but we aren't sure when they're going to start developing if we see a lot of that activity happening that would be a good time to have Council um, appoint a committee to to look at that again. Joyce's group prepares annual um, development reports, so we have all of that data based on building permits and things like that to give us pretty good estimates um, of what's going on in real time. That was the way the old reapportionment committee did it. Um, they they came over here to look at the new plat data and what was actually built. And uh, they just made those changes year after year. Um, was there a reason why we went away from that plan? Yeah, there was a lot of concern that the boundaries were changing too often. And so people didn't know what ward they were in, what, who they had to vote for, um, those kind of things. And so it's definitely a balancing act of making sure that you, you keep the, the wards equal over the next 10 years, but also um, don't get into a position where they're changing every year because that makes it almost impossible to right for in terms of voter turnout probably be good to do it every five or to you know do that it every five years. that sure. makes sense I mean I've, I've got one of the members gave me their the five years worth of data and how they made the changes every year and you know that might be an option councilman Holman to, to do it every five years and At bring them back it, and yeah. just to look I, at and yeah. see where we need to change I do have a question about that because if we're looking at like you're talking about growth ward eight potentially would be growing or two is not going to grow um and i understand that you're wanting to keep that westwood park but i mean is there a particular reason other than just the westwood golf well yeah. like i was saying i mean those those streets right there south of robinson are the only ones that have been in ward eight since ward eight was a thing uh, you know, you, you walk, look at the historical maps and Ward 8 went south down to the Canadian River. It's, brought, it's moved around a lot, but those, that little nexus of streets has always remained in Ward 8. Are you talking about where Sherry and those streets are? Exactly. So then the ones that are just to the south of the golf course, could you put those into Ward 2 to account for that ward not really growing, but Ward 8 would grow? I mean, I think it's a pretty minute change at this point. We could probably address it when that growth happens, but if it's... I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be really honest here, Matt. Where do you live? In that area. Okay. So then let's call it what it is. Well, sure. You don't want to be voted out of your ward. Yeah. I mean, it is the thing I say about historical precedent. I mean, that is, that is true. 
those streets have always been part of Ward 8. So I think re remaining consistent, that whether I live there or not, uh, is, is still the truth. Right, but at this point, to me, it looks a little political because we're talking about a, 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 point, a reappointment committee that did not know where you lived. Right. You know what I mean? I threw it out there as a suggestion to make the numbers work because it was always part of Ward 8. Um, it's not like I was trying to do anything malicious there. Um, right, it, but those houses to the south of that golf course have not always been part of Ward 8. I understand Sherry and all that have, but... Those that, houses to the south of the golf course are fairly new in consideration of what Norman has been. Um, just throwing that out there. <laughs> I don't want to get accused now of saying we're voting so that Matt can stay in his ward. Well, I, I think um, Councilman Sutley has a point. Um, instead of every five years, would you guys be okay with looking at the reapportionment and doing it the way they used to do it every one year, every, every year? To see for growth and make those changes on the fly, um, they're not. They wouldn't be major changes, according to what I've seen. Um, they would be small changes and wouldn't cause too much confusion with who and where they need to be and who. Yeah, they but that's for. in the future. We're talking about now. <coughs> we have to fix this tonight. Well, so I just want to make sure that whatever we're doing tonight I, I, I is truly looking at population and not where do we live what's going to work best for us in our next election like those aren't things that i mean we should even be considering <laughs> so i do have the old ward maps and hold on councilmember hall please is what we're discussing currently a point of clarification is this a charter change to talk what we're saying is oh we can just look at it again in five years or we can review everything my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is the first time that the council has even had the ability to have this kind of discussion, and that was a charter change voted on by the people, correct or no? We can, we can look at it whenever we want. We can't change it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the charter used to... Um, allow for an annual review or provide for an annual review by the reapportionment commission now if you wanted to look at the boundaries and change them um, between now and 2030 under the current language it would require a unanimous vote of council and you can do that and and it's still going back to the reapportionment ad hoc committee and following a similar process so <clears throat> if we wanted to review it in five years we would have an ad hoc reapportionment committee. Yes, if yes. council wanted to do that by unanimous vote, they would appoint a reapportionment ad hoc committee that would look at that. If we wanted to go back to the prior way of doing things, it would require a charter change. And that was a standing committee um, that met every year and reviewed the data and made recommendations. And I'm assuming that that was a charter review commission recommendation when yes. it was taken to the voters the last time for this charter change. yes in 2013 yeah mm -hmm. so once again i think we're losing sight here that we appointed representatives of our wards to a commission that recommended the map that we had in front of us at the beginning Well, mine didn't, so <laughs> because it wasn't continued to be looked at. I mean, from my understanding, from you, you met twice for like an hour and a half both times, and then that was it, right? I. So it's not like they spent hours and hours and hours pouring over this. And as Catherine often reminds us, we don't always have to take recommendations um, as scripture. So I think it's something to look at and to consider and then also take into account the work that was done. So I do think the right thing was going back to the proposed map, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know how everybody loses with this one necessarily. I do understand people's concerns, but. You know, but you know, the same thing with, with the, the Ward 6 rep and the Ward 5 rep, they had the same concerns that they only spent a couple of hours looking at the maps and came to a proposed map what we've done tonight is look at the proposed map and the numbers do work they're within the deviations and we have two members of the committee here this right now that can you know if we choose to ask their opinion but it's to us because the charter says is to us and we're making the decision 
And to be quite frankly, you know, to be quite frank, we probably wouldn't have been here if it wasn't brought to my attention by Mrs. You know, my my work five rep that um, they're looking at political issues and partisan issues and making these maps um, and drawing lines. That's the whole reason we're where we're at today. And and my objection was that you know when when you call the <coughs> elected person in that ward dangerous and has to be considered what do you want me to think about what do you want my ward to think about you've heard them say this and so they they, they doubled down which is okay and they submitted the same map lines the charter gives us the right to look at this what they've done and make these small changes and I think what we've done is make those small changes it does meet the parameters as outlined by the charter and there's the deviations is less than 10 percent and I think we all had input in this we all you know we, we looked at it we, we we talked with the fellow council members here with the wards attached and adjacent and bordering our wards and we got to what they may have gotten to mm -hmm. if they had spent more than two and a half hours looking at the map that's all I'm saying is that they didn't have the you know the the, the, the hours in to look at everything and in two and a half hours we just changed it and modified it and amended it to make all the numbers work so I don't see what's wrong with this so the numbers do work the parameters for the deviation do work the two committee members are nodding their heads that this works so I mean so I don't see anything wrong with this process all right so I think <clears throat> What we did, we, we, we modified it, that's our right, we amended it, that was our right, and I think we were all in a happy place because all the numbers worked for us. And that's where we should have been. The numbers worked this way too as well. And I think, you know, it's just my, my, my two cents. Ms. Walker, I have a procedural question. So if this is what we go with tonight, let's say we do, it goes into ordinance and we have the second public hearing in January, and again, all, maybe all three of the other wards come out, I don't know, can we amend it then? Or do we have to have another 30 days? You can amend it then. Um, there's not any case law that, that suggests that you would have to re-notice another 30 days. Okay. Um, I think we would treat it like, similar to like we do zoning items that get postponed, the meeting uh, is publicly postponed and that provides notice. Um, so I don't think you would have to tack on another 30 days. But it could be amended at that meeting. Yes, it would be a challenge to, to draft the ordinance <coughs> because it is legislative. I really would like to have the final language you know, written out and not be amending it on the floor. It would be a challenge to do, amend it on the floor, but it, it could be done. Understood, thank you. Can we? Councilmember Holman. Oh, sorry. So just going to note, you know, we've only had a city council ward system uh, since the 70s and so there was not a ward boundary in 1971 so the earliest that Brenda was able to provide for me was 1981 and I have 1991 90, 2001 11 and I would just note it's not necessarily a criteria historical you know an area being historically in a ward but just for clarification I would note that ward that the neighborhood south of and including the golf course has always been in Ward 8. And before the 2011 changes, it actually went all the way down to Main Street. So Ward 8 went all the way to Main Street until 2011. So that area has historically been in Ward 8. Again, I don't know if that's necessarily criteria for keeping or subtracting an area, but just wanted to be clear uh, about that historical pres uh, precedent is, is accurate. Um, and just, uh, I don't know, I think I sent everybody all the, all the historic ward maps. They are very interesting how they've changed every 10 years, uh, especially the 1981. It doesn't show half the city in it, but, but it's an old Xerox copy. So anyway, I just want to make that clarification. Thank you. Council Berlin? Uh, I haven't jumped in here really. <clears throat> I wasn't a fan of the process either, but where we're at right now, it's supposed to be done from this snap uh, snapshot in time. It's not supposed to do be with future growth. It's supposed to be from this, what is this right now? 
because to be honest, we haven't been real friendly with growth. And then we're kind of known for not being friendly with growth. And we've proven that up here with our votes. So trying to look at future growth shouldn't be a criteria at all. Yeah, there's space available if we approve it. And that's gonna be a rotating thing all the time with council members coming and going. If these numbers hit, I don't, I don't see what the deal is. And even if Matt lives over there, I, I wouldn't mind blame a guy for wanting to keep in the ward that he's in, the ward he represents. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we got it right now where it all balances out. And I have 2,100 new voters. <laughs> and you need them. If I was going to run for re-election, that might be a thing. Councilmember Holman, I would uh, I agree that future apparently as according to the city attorney future population growth isn't really a factor but I would note that according to the census Norman had the third highest total population growth in the state of Oklahoma it grew by almost 20,000 people that was more than double the population growth of Moore which only had 7,000 so we grew by more than double we grew by more than an entire city council ward in the last 10 years we grew by enough to add a whole new ward, just to make that clear. Tulsa grew by 22,000. We grew by almost as much total population as the city of Tulsa, which has over 400,000 people. So, you know, I, I hear that we've been anti-growth and we're not, you know, we're not uh, easy to do business with, but if you drive around Norman, there is construction absolutely everywhere. There are so many houses being built in Ward 7 I can't keep up with the number of new residents I'm getting. And that's reflected here, how my ward is the only ward not gaining any people. It's the only one losing. I'm losing 2,000 people because the houses in Ward 7 are being built so fast. And the growth you know, in my area is projected to grow significantly. So I just want to you know, put that out there that we do have this reputation about what some people think about Norman, but the reality is we are growing more than Edmond, more. Broken Arrow, Lawton, Lawton's losing people, uh, and Tulsa's just barely ahead of us. Oklahoma City made up almost 50% of all the population growth in the whole state, so nobody's on their level. They are blowing everybody away, so just wanted to put that out there, that growth in the next 10 years is a real thing to think about, even if it's not technically a criteria that we should consider here. All right, Councilmember Tortorello, you made the motion to amend. Is this the version you would like to put forward as the said amended version? Yes. Are there any other comments from Council regarding this motion to amend with the version you see in front of you? None. Oh, go ahead. It's approved tonight. Could we get a map of this, like, very quickly? So we can... <laughs> Tonight? Maybe. No. No. <laughs> Early in the morning, please, Brenda. Okay. Fair question. Um, the motion on the floor is to adopt a resolution amending the boundaries recommended. Oops, sorry. Uh, resolution amending the boundaries as amended as in front of you. <laughs> Council members, you may cast your votes. Just to be on the safe side, even though we just had a public hearing, we, this is an amendment. So I would like to open it back up to public comment regarding the amended version. Any public comment? Come on up. Let's go. Michael Blunk. memory now I've been up here enough all right uh, so uh, I got a couple of quick comments as so I'm gonna make this quick for three minutes uh, one thing that really kind of does irk me we, we're gonna go back to comments made by uh, by my council member uh, a little while ago 
this seems very odd for this process. I just want to make it very clear. I've been in this council chamber several times in the last two years, and I've heard over and over again our hesitancy to make policy from the diocese. And here I just watched elected officials carve up their own town in front of us in real time. And while I know that we, we did have, you know, the, the, the vote of the people to make sure this is a, in a process that could be, could be part of the things, to have our elected officials have a part in, in the redistricting process, I'll be honest, it feels super sketch. Like the idea that, that you know, we had things go to committee, the idea we had, you know, non, our non-elected officials, people who aren't our council members have this discussion, right? We had them have discussion, lay out maps that worked originally, right? Uh, and then we have this process where once again, we fiddle with it in real time in like what, like an hour and a half? And now we're like, this is, I don't know. It does, it does not feel very democratic. It feels kind of awkward. We saw that obviously you guys work very closely together. You know where all of each other live for the most part, which makes it even more awkward, which, which was pointed out by Brandon Studley uh, for, you know, no offense against Mr. Beacock, but I mean, that's just, that's, that's the reason that we chose to take this original process away from the city council for the original proposal. Uh, I'll, I'll just be honest, I, I understand the legitimate grievances from folks over in Ward 6 and, and, and 5, but if we're talking about trying to make sure that everyone from that committee was satisfied, well, we have like the other half of that committee isn't here either, right? So just because we had a handful of folks from that committee here doesn't mean that this process was any fairer. The whole thing seems like a giant mess, and the small tweaking we've done, I don't think it makes much of a difference from the original suggestion, except now that you know, we have this section of ward, of ward 8 that is now still where it is. Point is, that all sounded pretty messy, but the point is that this thing was just, it was a train wreck to watch. Uh, I don't know, I just, I was pretty disappointed by the whole process. And yeah, that's, I mean, more of my thoughts are a little more consolidated than that, but guys, what just happened? So, there you go. Thank you. I'd like to also make a quick comment. Uh, I've also Mr. Wagner, correct? Oh, Introduce yes. yourself, please. Uh, Mark Wagner, Ward 5. Uh, I uh, have also been in these chambers uh, many times in the last couple of years. I hadn't been before that, and just a lot of issues have come up. And I have to say that this is the first time that I've seen a city council actually respond to any comments from the people that the citizens that come here before the council not just for Ward 5 and not just not any other ward. I've seen all sorts of different uh, arguments, complaints, whatever, and it seems like every time council goes back and votes pretty much how we expected them to vote before any comments were heard. And so I have to applaud this council that it seems that you've at least taken uh, to heart the comments of citizens who are legitimately concerned and have made adjustments and have acted in accordingly. So I, I do appreciate that. And so credit where credit is due. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Goodchild, Ward 5. Um, I would like to replicate that and say I really appreciate you listening to your constituents, particularly those in Ward 5 and Ward 6. Uh, those were the two. This plan that was sent to you was not a unanimous plan. Um, I had kept asking for some different boundaries on Ward 5, and I appreciate the council looking at that. Um, I just wanted you to know that it was not unanimously sent to you, and I concur with Ward 2 that when things happen and you don't feel listened to, it makes you feel very upset. But as they told me, everybody has to give and take a little bit. And I, I'm, I feel more comfortable with this plan than I did the one we sent to you. And I appreciate all of you listening to us. Thank you. Rich Lewis, Ward 7. Uh, today, right now, we've just been an hour and a half, and we accomplished the exact same thing that the committee handed to you 
um, uh, that, that we're all meeting about today. So in an hour and a half, we uh, got to the exact same level of balance as the committee sent to you. I was the Ward 7 representative on this committee, and I was happy to do so. And we spent some time uh, moving some stuff around. Some of the issues that were, that were brought out in the public were uh, related to gerrymandering. Um, I, I, I would argue that if we look at the maps uh, as uh, presented to you from the committee compared to this one right here, um, that that should and could uh, still be a concern uh, for the public. I would also like to point out to you that we moved two squares uh, from Ward 6 into Ward 8 and three uh, from Ward 6 into Ward five from the, the proposed map that came from the committee. Um, and some of the concerns from our Ward 5 friends were that uh, we moved 11 miles of farmland into Ward 6 that, that you know, does not, you know, whatever. Uh, and that the, we've now moved three of those uh, miles back into Ward 5, um, which would suggest that those concerns uh, could and should still be valid um, from our friends, uh, because now we're sure we're not moving 11 miles, we're just moving eight. Um, which is still uh, a concern, uh, one would think. Um, the, the real question here uh, is where did we end up um, uh, uh, as folks who just spent an hour and a half of, of everyone's time recognizing that we are in the exact same spot that we were um, compared to what we, what we sent forward? Sure, some of the lines are a little bit different, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, this was... Um, this was about something different, um, and it was and it was about something something else, and um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you. Alex Torvey, Ward Six. Um, I think this is a lot better than what the uh, reapportion committee submitted to you guys. It's not perfect. There are some other things I'd like to see change. That's why I think it should go back to committee or a new committee be reappointed. But this is much better than what it was to start with. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other public comment. Any final comment from council? Councilmember Tortorello, and that might still be there. Is that, you good? I appreciate the council looking at this, and you know, we are following the charter as it's written. Um, the reapportionment committee submitted the plans to us, and we looked at it, and it was well within our rights to make the modifications, and I think we did a great job tonight. Um, Again, um, I don't think we would have been here if it wasn't for the hyperpartisan remarks made and brought to my attention. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we work well together. Everyone agrees that the numbers do match. The parameters for the deviation are within the appropriate numbers. And uh, this is the function of governments, you know. If it's within the charter and we have that right to look at what was submitted to us, um, we did that tonight. So. You know, it, it's it's part of the de democratic process, and and um, going forward, you know, uh, you know, I think we all did a good job. So that's it. Thank you, Councilmember Holman. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I just uh, want to thank everybody that's been involved in this process. But I specifically want to thank uh, Rich Lubers, who I appointed to this committee uh, because I know him. I believe strongly that he is a person of integrity, and um, I just thank you for giving your time and willingness to serve our ward in this capacity. Thank you. Councilmember Studley. <sighs> I have a lot to say. I'm trying to figure out my words. Um, I do agree with what Rich was saying that I feel like this had way more to do with uh, just some personal issues rather than what it did to have to do with ward boundaries and gerrymandering. And I think if you do wanna talk about gerrymandering, what we did right now was gerrymandering in my opinion, because we're looking at where people live versus the straight lines and full on numbers and things like that. Um, taking three miles back into ward five absolutely did nothing honestly for what you guys were here talking about and what your concerns were. Um, I really wholeheartedly do not believe that 
in those meetings, the comment that Larla made had anything to do with how these numbers were drawn. In fact, Larla wasn't even at the first meeting. She was um, at the second meeting and didn't make a comment at all until about midway through. And it was purely because of uh, what your Ward 5 representative kept saying, she wants to keep like people with like people and didn't want Ward 5 developed whenever uh, Council Member Tortorello has talked several times about being uh, in favor of development um, and saying that a, a, he sh he's not in favor of telling what a man and so um, with that, I think that it was very personal and did not have anything to do with gerrymandering. And what Larla said was that he's dangerous based off of some actions that he has made in the past prior to the election. And that's, you know, if Larla feels that uh, Council Member Tortorello is dangerous, then that's her opinion. And sh maybe that appointment committee was not the right place to state that opinion, but it had absolutely nothing to do with how these ward boundaries were drawn. I'm glad that we got the time to kind of look at this and move some things around and see that there it could be manipulated slightly, but it did not get manipulated to the way that you, uh, Ms. Goodchild, had wanted because you were looking at Cedar Lane and those uh, houses had nothing to do with what we just moved. So I don't see how you could be happy with the changes that were made um, because it really didn't affect the farm area in Ward 5, which is what you guys are really concerned about. Um, I also want to make a point that just because you're splitting up agricultural areas, um, to, ha to me, it would seem that you would have more representation on council. Because as you've seen from your own Ward 5 representative, he's going to vote for development if that's what is in the best interest of that person who owns that property, which has nothing to do with agriculture land that we saw in the Eagle Cliff as he brought up before himself and he voted for the development of Eagle Cliff to cut into and kind of ruin and harm some possible farmland in the future. But that's what you guys are dealing with. That's what you guys have brought before us with your complaints and we at least did move it, but I, I'm, I am personally not happy with the results. And that's all I have to say. Um. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings about how this went down tonight and the, the process that um, transpired, I guess I should say. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily, um, you know, a bad thing to work through the process and, you know, look at what has been done and kind of illuminate and you know, bring to light uh, what this process looked like for the, the committee. Um, but I don't know that this was the right course of action for us to take um, tonight. Um, as has been said before me, uh, this map that we've got right here in front of us is honestly not that different than what was proposed from our commission. Um, and so I don't know how um, those concerns of our Ward 6 and our Ward 5 residents are really being addressed by this, frankly. Um, so to me, this is not really about the numbers. This has been about the process and what we did and the precedent that we potentially are setting by bringing a nonpartisan, citizen-run commission that we have set aside outside of city council's hands to do the work of doing a reapportionment every 10 years to look at our ward boundaries, right? This should be outside of our hands on city council. That is something that I firmly believe. And tonight, that's not what happened. Um, I think that it's dangerous for us to sit up here as elected officials and draw boundaries based on the things that we know. We know where we live. We know our districts. We know our wards very well. We know, yeah, <laughs> we know our voters. We understand things differently than, you know, citizens that are given information from our staff members. Um, and I would just caution that what we did tonight is potentially precedent setting down the road for future 
city councils, for future commissions. Um, and I'm concerned about the process that we took tonight. Um, I don't necessarily have much to say about this final map. I mean, it's fine. I thought, um, like I said, it's not much different than the one that was brought to us by the commission. Um, and so I don't really know what to do with that, <laughs> frankly. Um, I think that we, this was motivated by something a lot different than just um, changing some slight ward boundaries in five and six. Um, and I think that it was um, motivated to, to change um, some bigger conversations and to allow this council to do what it did tonight by moving boundaries to set that precedent moving forward. Um, and that is something that I think uh, we shouldn't have done. So I will just leave it at that. I think, um, yeah, those are my comments. Thank you. Councilmember Foreman. Uh, so I'm just gonna shoot from the hip and I, everything about tonight sucked. I don't like the feeling that I feel right now. Every single one of us on this dais is ticked off. Um, I know Councilmember Tortorello and I were very concerned about our boundaries. I think that was our biggest concern. Um, trying to respect the feelings. I know that we couldn't give Ward 5 everything, but I think they can at least appreciate that we tried. And I think everyone saw that the process is very difficult. Um, we tried to manipulate things in a lot of ways, and it's very hard to do. Um, we do have, we have the Planning Commission. They, they're experts. They review things. They present stuff to us, and we don't have to accept it. We can come up here, and we can make an amendment to things. So I think us moving bound wards is within the realm of what we can do. Um, do I feel great about how it all happened and transpired? Absolutely not. Um, I will vote for this. Um, if it passes, if it fails, I don't know. We'll just do whatever it is that we have to do to move forward. But I think hopefully at the very least the public saw that this is not, we're just in here trying to move lines to do what it's, very difficult and it's very frustrating and Joyce thank you so much for all of your clicking and dealing with us you were kind of you know getting it from us and I apologize um, but City Council is not an easy job and I'm a parent this is way harder than raising a child so because <laughs> you know your child eventually has to go to bed um, so I apologize for Council's behavior tonight I do think that we were all a little brash um, maybe people don't want me to apologize on their behalf, but I feel like that's appropriate to do. I don't know. We tried. If it gets shot down, we'll just we'll try again. I don't know. We have to start from scratch. Whatever the appropriate thing we have to do, then I'm open to do. Thank you, Councilmember Hall. Well, first of all, I would just like to thank um, Miss Goodchild, Mr. Lubber, Lubbers. Is that right? Lubbers. Okay. I want to get your name right. Thank you, and Mr. Zorba for sticking it out and um, getting to witness um, what you all went through. <laughs> and I appreciate the diversity of thought that was in the um, commission. And I also wanna thank publicly the rest of the um, representatives from every ward that served on the commission, including the Ward 4 representative, Kay Holliday. And I think I don't really have very much to add except for the fact that there is a reason that we turned over the responsibility of taking a serious look at reportionment to a committee that is not made up of elected officials. Thank you. Councilman Peacock. Yeah, um, so I feel like I gotta defend myself here a little bit. Um, first off, obviously this has been um, known for months or since, since this recommendation came out and I have yet to make a stink or a complaint about this. Uh, was fully willing to approve the map as it was with me drawing out of Ward 8. So um, I only made the suggestion to make the numbers work. I mean, I, just restoring what was there and not cannibalizing another ward. Uh, you can tell I'm flustered, but there absolutely was zero malicious intent there. Um, it was just a ready-made solution that worked. Um, the fact that I'm getting accused of something more sinister, really, it, it hits hard and it hits hard in a bad way. 
Um, I think you guys probably know me and know my character and know that I, I wouldn't do anything to undermine this process or uh, jeopardize uh, that reputation. So um, I just want to make it clear that it was simply restoring what was already there and nothing more. Thank you. Council Member Lynn. I feel like I don't have anything to apologize for. This was voter approved. This is the process. This was mandated by the voters of Norman. This is what we are supposed to do, and this is what we've been given a mandate to do. If you don't like how it worked out, there's always a charter change. It might seem awkward that council members are doing their thing, but this is what was voter approved. I have nothing to apologize about that for. I'm happy to let's rock and roll and get something done. That's it. Thank you. Councilmember Studley. Councilmember Peacock, I am not accusing you personally. I'm just saying that that's the appearance that it gives. I 100% trust and believe in your morals and your ethics, and I know that you always do the right things for the right reasons. So I just want to put that out there. This is nothing personal against you. It's just purely of how it looks on this map, that one little part coming back in um, just looks a little off to me. And again, I know it's not anything you're personally doing. I'm just saying that it just looks funny. And I feel like if we're being accused of gerrymandering because of uh, 11 square miles being moved into Ward 6 from Ward 5 and we only move three back, now what, now what are people going to say even more so that we've put you back in your own ward? So that's, it has nothing to do with you. It's just the perception, so. Thank you. So, I cannot support these changes tonight based on the fact that, yes, we can do it, but should we do it? I don't know if you've been following the accusations of gerrymandering at the state capitol, and it looks like we're doing the exact same thing. We are picking our voters. And I agree with the comments of how we, we have a process to take the, a very political thing and put it in the hands of residents. And as you heard, I don't pick the committee members. <laughs> they all came from the representatives. And of course, newer council members did not have a say in who was appointed. And then it was approved by the council. But I, I can't support this for a variety of reasons. Um, I know that we have voted against recommendations from boards and commissions before, but this is a once in a decade commission with a very special purpose. So I appreciate everyone's efforts. I, I loved, rash or not, the working together that happened and the hashing things out. I think it was a good night for the council, but I can't, I mean, if, we, if, it, was if it was political before, it's really political now. And I, this is something that belongs to the people, regardless, uh, I believe, of what the charter says because of what it means for decades. So. With that, council members, you may cast your votes. Okay, I'll vote to motion fails by a vote of four to five. Voting in favor, council member Holman, council member Foreman, council member Tortorello, council member Lynn. Okay, I believe that brings us back to the recommendation as presented. Well, you just need a motion. Yeah, yeah. You, your motion on the floor was to me. I mean, you didn't. Motion. One. Okay, do I have a second? Second. So if we approve whatever map we approve, if we approve it tonight, then there's, we have the first and second reading. On that second reading, the council could choose at that time based on public feedback to say, ah, after thinking about it, we don't wanna do this map. And could start, what would happen? We start over again, we, the committee goes back or? Uh, the charter's not silent on that issue. Um, it could be council just continuing to work on it. You could opt to send it back to the reapportionment committee. Um, so there is further opportunity for the public to look at what we send forward and participate in that second hearing at least, or second reading, 
give feedback and then the council make another final decision perhaps Okay, and as we clarified earlier, that if it doesn't pass on the second reading, we're not breaking any sort of deadline. Right. There's no pressing deadline from the state or federal government. Yeah, that has to be done within a reasonable amount of time, I believe is the language used in state statute. Yeah, I, I, had, I thought I had remembered that there was some, maybe it's not for city council awards, but that there was a deadline for the publishing of the census data, maybe it was a six months or a year to when boundaries had to be finalized, but you're saying that's not? It's six months from uh, for the committee to get their work done. Okay, so it doesn't have to be finalized within a time period after the census. Okay. Councilman Foreman, point of clarification? Yes, what if it fails tonight? What, what was the option? I've heard so many things tonight. And we need to go back to the drawing board tonight if we want to follow the charters uh, deadline, which says you have to act on a resolution within 30 days of the ad hoc committee's recommendation. So without saying That's it, the we deadline. need to approve it just so we can move forward. We need to approve something. Oh, God, okay. Yes, great point of clarification. That is the deadline that we're under. Right. A resolution. A resolution tonight based on the final recommendation from the reapportionment commission is the only deadline we are under. Who drafted this charter amendment? Okay, all right. So we have a motion and a second to approve the recommended ward boundaries that was presented by the reapportionment commission. Are there any questions from council regarding this <laughs> motion? Seeing none, this is an opportunity for members of the public to make comments regarding this motion. If I could, Karen Goodchild, since I was mentioned, I never said some of the things I'm accused of. I said this was a community of interest because we are all zoned ag. I never said I was happy with this map. I said it was better, and I appreciate the council listening to constituents. I am not happy with this map. It's better. I would like to see, and the council did not want to move a lot of things, I would like to see the more southern part go into seven or one, I would like to see the wrapping around Brookhaven, I'll put that in quotes because that was in the minutes for Ward 3 into Ward 8. So to say I'm happy, I just think it's better and I appreciate the council listening to constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Hackman with Ward 5. Um, tonight's exercise, I think, is self-evident of what we've been suggesting uh, during the last public hearing and then this session as well. This needs to go back to the committee, plain and simple. Um, as a member of the Charter Review Commission, we met multiple times on key topics that are important to the, the lifeblood of Norman and its constitution. And there was a lot of give and take, there was a lot of debate. Ultimately, we came up with some decisions. This was a two meeting process, not counting the vote. Making big decisions about the boundaries of the individual wards. And even tonight, the council was ready to start altering those lines. Thank you for willing your willingness to do that. But that's not your responsibility. That is the responsibility of the committee 
your job is to send this back to the committee. That's my, I mean, I think you all really understand that. And yeah, there were a lot of issues from the representative for Ward 1 who should have recused herself from the vote and all of the other issues that went along. But tonight is self-evident. The committee needs to go back to work, start the job again, and then let's take another look at it. Expediency is not your friend. Expediency is not going to help the city of Norman. Let's do it right. Thank you. Any other public comment? Mr. Buck. Michael Blank, 4 2. Um, in general, uh, I know since we're now, we're, as, I, as I understand, we're currently now back to the map that was originally proposed by the committee. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. In general, uh, I, like I mentioned at the start of the meeting this evening, uh, I am okay with that being passed personally. Uh, if, if, if the council does decide that that should go back to a committee, that honestly, to be honest at this point, feels maybe not a bad call. If, if, we, if it comes to that. The big issue we ran into, at least for me, the big issue we ran into was the fact that the moment that, yes, while it, it is within the power of the council to, to redraw lines if necessary, right? I mean, that's part of the charter. We talked about that earlier this evening. Obviously, though, as we've mentioned, it kind of raised the temperature quite a bit, right? Uh, so honestly, I kind of agree with the notion that if, if we have to, going back to a committee especially if there's no hard deadline, right? It's not like the city budget, you know, we're, we're not, we're not going to get sued if we go back to the drawing board, right? So if that's the case, then potentially that might be what we have to do ultimately. I, again, if we do vote for this particular map, I'm fine. But obviously though, I'm not from the same wards that everyone else who had issues. So uh, my biggest concern was just having our elected officials having such an impact on their own like districts. And, and, not, and again, not to, not to accuse anybody of, of any foul play, but, that's the, but the point being though, that any time you have elected officials in that process, it, it raises the specter of that. It also, uh, it, it also just looks really messy, right? Like we talked about again, not wanting to be crafting policy on the fly on the diocese. Um, this feels like something that, that, that just kind of illustrates that same issue before. So um, I guess in closing, I, I am okay with, with this one being passed, but if we go back to committee, that might be uh, the more community-centric approach at this point, so. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Wagner, Ward 5. <clears throat> I have to agree with uh, the previous speakers that I believe this should go back to committee because this has obviously become political. Uh, we just demonstrated in the last hour and a half that council, uh, for all everyone saying how difficult a process this is, council got the numbers to work out in an hour and a half. And so a group of people that have no idea of where anybody lives or any of those other political issues should be able to make the numbers work very, very quickly. This should not be a huge, big job. And I said that in my first comments. This is not rocket surgery. This is a matter of just making numbers work out. So I think the appropriate thing right now with all the <clears throat> politicalization, all of the comments that were made uh, back and forth, uh, it just needs to go back to committee and, and let's get the numbers to work out and, and get this right. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other public comment, are there any final comments from council regarding this item? Council Berlin. I'd like to make a motion to send it back to committee. We have to pass a deadline, I believe, because it came out of the 30 days. So my understanding is we have to pass this tonight, but can fail it later. <laughs> oh, this, yeah, this language needs some changing, doesn't it? Um, so the options are to adopt the resolution that the committee has sent to you without modification, reject it or adopt it with modification as it deems necessary. Another option maybe would be to reject the resolution ask the committee to go back and bring forward another recommendation. So that's an option. That could be an option. I second that motion. I 
my second memo is. Why, go ahead. Okay. You. Here, well, that so can you, motion, so he reads it. for clarification. <laughs> I'd like to clarify my motion to reject <laughs> and send it to committee. Just for Robert's rules, yeah. it's not an amendment that's on the floor. It's a motion to adopt. So if you want to make a motion to reject, you got to deal with the motion on the floor first to adopt. You need to vote it down or whatever you need to do. Can the motioner withdraw the motion? No, nope, it belongs to the body now. Got it. Because it's been motioned and seconded. So we need to vote on what's on the floor. And if that fails, then you can come back and make a motion to reject. It's not like an amendment. It's a whole different motion. Okay, then I will call the question on the motion to adopt so we can go ahead and vote on that one. Anyone arguing with that? All right. The motion to adopt as recommended passes by a vote of five to four. Well, that was unexpected. Uh, voting in, voting against, Councilmember Peacock, Councilmember Foreman, Councilmember Tortorello, Councilmember Lynn. That's it. So you are done. Ms. Walker, I'm sure there will be plenty of emails coming your way about the next steps. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>